Okay, looks like it is working now. Here is the YouTube link. And we're all set. Okay, good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, or good evening, where you are. Um, welcome to day number eight uh, of May Institute on Computation and Statistics for Mass Spectrometry and Proteomics. Let me share my screen. So, so far, we have talked about um, various ways of uh, collecting and processing data, uh, which we acquire in quantitative experiments. And then we also spent some time talking about R, either kind of the beginner level or at the more advanced level. And today and tomorrow, we will focus more on the next steps of uh, data analysis. So what happens after we uh, process the data using tools such as Skyline or FragPipe. And now we are interested in the statistical analysis of these experiments where we would like to detect uh, changes between various conditions, find which proteins are differentially abundant um, or regulated and so on. And so the plan for today and for uh, tomorrow is to focus on MS stats and its interface with the existing data processing tools and on statistical analysis. Uh, today, we will focus on label-free experiments, in particular DIA. And then tomorrow, we will focus on label-based label experiments, uh, in particular with uh, TMT. Uh, before before we start, let me just uh, remind you of the logistics uh, in case you are joining us for the first time. So at the bottom of your screen, you have a chat uh, button. Let us use it just for things such as, hi, how are you? Or I can hear you. And uh, otherwise, if you have questions related to the technical parts uh, of the presentation, please use the Q&A uh, button. Uh, the Q&A allows us to manage the questions more effectively, and also it allows us to save the questions and make them available after the session. Uh, several people commented that uh, the Q&A are accessible, but you cannot download them, so I need to change the permission on the files I didn't realize. So as soon as we're done with the presentation, I will change uh, the permission. Uh, well, otherwise, let us go ahead and uh, get started. So today I will be leading the first part uh, of the presentation. My name is Olga Vitek. I am a faculty in the Curie College of Computer Sciences uh, at Northeastern University in uh, Boston. I have a PhD in statistics from Purdue University, and I did my postdoc in the Institute for Systems Biology in the Abrasol lab uh, back then. After that, I went back to Purdue as a professor in statistics. And since the last eight years, I am now in the College of Computer Sciences at Northeastern. And also joining us today, uh, Mina Choi. Mina is a senior research scientist at uh, Genentech. Mina holds a PhD in statistics from Purdue. And for some time, she also was a postdoc and then a research scientist at Northeastern. Uh, most importantly, Mina used to be the original lead developer of MS Stats, and a lot of work that we will talk about today is actually uh, her work. So we're very fortunate to have Mina today as one of the instructors. And let me also introduce Devon Kohler. Uh, Devon is a PhD student uh, in computer science at Northeastern. Devon is currently one of the lead developers of MS Stats. In particular, he develops um, shiny graphical user interface so that we can use uh, this type of interface for interacting with MS stats. And we're also we're very happy to have Devon as uh, TA today. Tomorrow, Devon will actually lead part of the discussion presenting the broader 
MS Stats uh, ecosystem. And let me also welcome back Brendan, who was leading the Skyline discussion for today's last week. And so he will also um, make a bridge between the discussions of last week to the analysis in MS Stats in the second part um, of the presentation today. Okay, thank you so much. So now we will go ahead and get started with the technical uh, material. Let me just, here we go. So I will jump in uh, right away and let's talk about MS Stats, what it is. Uh, so MS Stats is a, used to be a package and now it's a family of uh, packages uh, which are based in R and distributed via Bioconductor. And fundamentally, this is a family of packages which focuses on a series of tools for quantitative proteomics. Uh, at the very kind of core of the question that MS Stats is answering is which proteins change in abundance. What is important is that it focuses on various levels of complexity, in particular complex designs such as factorial experiments, paired design, time cores. So designs which have more repeated measurements. So anything which is more complex than two comparing two conditions. However, you can of course compare two conditions as well uh, with MS stats. A byproduct of this type of answering this type of questions is also uh, quantifying the abundance of a protein in each subject on a relative scale that can be compared between runs. So this type of uh, summaries are useful if you want to do, for example, clustering or use protein level quantities as input to some machine learning tools or biomarker discovery tools. Technically speaking, in terms of the experiments, um, MS stats can handle a variety of types of um, acquisition strategies, in particular data dependent acquisition, either label free or labeled with TMT um, or SILAC or something else, data independent acquisition, also PRM and SRM. So this is the type of experiments uh, that uh, Brandon would call chromatography-based quantification. And of course, also TMT, which is based on reporter ion quantification. More recently, we went beyond just uh, studying abundances of proteins. So there is also uh, functionalities for post-translational modification. So for example, deten detecting changes in PTM and distinguishing them from changes in overall protein abundance. Uh, and then also structural proteomics for limited proteolysis. So there are quite a few uh, functionalities. In terms of the input to MS stats, the input will be the output of data processing tools, such as we discussed last week, so Skyline and uh, FragPipe, but also MS stats uh, provides converters to a much broader variety of tools, in particular MaxQuant, OpenMS, um, and open source and also commercial tools such as Spectronaut, uh, Proteom Discover, etc. These converters, they are actually very important. Uh, they do multiple things. They not only, you know, take data in one format and transfer it in another format, but also they do various um, types of quality control, uh, such as uh, checking for the correctness of the input, checking for duplicate features, uh, checking for decoy uh, peptide IDs, if you happen to use target decoy for quantification and so on. Uh, we will see some of this during the hands-on session. So these converters are really useful because it means that besides just being convenient, it also means that you can potentially have a same standardized type of statistical analysis, regardless of the tool you used to process the data upstream. And this is very important because this allows us to understand how processing strategies impact our statistical conclusions. If we can analyze uh, later on all the uh, resulting data sets in a uh, consistent manner. Of course, the core of MS stats is actual statistical modeling and statistical uh, analysis. So we will, and I will talk about this today. We have models which are very flexible, account for complex designs, missing values, outliers, and so on, they're also numerically stable with a lot of attention to making sure that parameter estimation is stable and scalable. Um, a good thing is that a lot of this work is done behind the scenes so that the users do not have to be experts in statistics to use that. And MS Stats recognizes 
just from the input formats, the type of experiments and the type of data, and then uh, fits the right uh, models. And also beyond just uh, quantifying proteins on a relative scale, we have a lot more additional functionalities, uh, in particular methods for system suitability, quality control, assay characterization in terms of limits of detection, limits of quantification, and something which we do already and we're interested in doing more is using our data sets that we analyze as a pilot study for something else. So for the next experiment, we can learn the extent of variability from the current uh, data set and uh, try to understand what would be the minimal sample size and also what would be the optimal allocation of resources for a follow-up experiment which uses the same measurement workflow and the same type of biological material, but maybe wanting to get, gain more sensitivity or answer slightly different questions. So this is really the scope uh, of MSTATS. And before I go any further, I would really like to acknowledge many people who have been contributing uh, to that. So Mina, as I mentioned, was one of the original lead developers and a lot of work I present today is really her uh, contribution. I would like to highlight Mateusz Staniak, who now that Mina is a Genentech, Mateusz is the lead developer of uh, MSTATS and also uh, Ting and Devon, who have made a lot of contributions. Ting focused on TMT. Uh, Devon has worked on PTM and LEAP and also Shiny. And also Melanie has been a very important collaborator in terms of integrating MS uh, with other interfaces such as uh, Galaxy. So this work was supported in large part by Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, which allowed us to uh, restructure the code to make it scalable and make more robust. If you have been using MS stats in the last uh, few years and haven't used it recently, uh, since the last year or so, the entire code base of MS stats has been completely rewritten to make it much more effective. And so we will hear a little bit today and especially tomorrow from Devon. So how this structure actually is organized. So there are converters, base MS stats, MS stats TMT, and so on, and then there are additional interfaces um, for uh, in interactive interfaces. Okay, so let's start with the overview of MS stats. So what I would like to do is to talk about some really basic uh, MS stats features, and then as much as time allows, talk about good reasons why we would be using MS stats as opposed to let's say a t-test or some other um, methods. So what would be the benefits specifically for the case of uh, DIA for today? So this is a typical um, data processing uh, workflow in MS stats um, from a uh, statistician's perspective. So, um, you know, oftentimes when people focus on proteomics and data acquisition, there will be um, you know, a lot of steps of data process, of sample processing, sample handling, data acquisition, and then there's like a little box data analysis. So statisticians think about this in the opposite way. There is quite a bit that has to happen before we collect the data and as much as has to happen after we collect the data. And of course, data collection is in the middle. So I will walk, I will start from this part. And then if time allows, I will talk a little bit about the uh, method validation and uh, system suitability as well. But first thing, experimental design. This is really very important because if the experiment is designed incorrectly, then no amount of statistical sophistication can really help us compensate for the flaws of design. And so from our perspective, what is really important is understand what are the goals of the study, in particular, do we just want to do exploratory analysis, some kind of unsupervised analysis? Do we want to do biomarker discovery, which would be more uh, supervised classification? Or do we want to do population level differential analysis? If we had all day, I would tell you more the differences between these methods. But uh, the long story short is that these different goals require different statistical and machine learning techniques. And so MS stats focuses specifically on differential analysis. So if we find proteins which change in abundance between conditions, these proteins are not necessarily biomarkers, for example, and that's really important to remember. And so, and the reason for that is the differential analysis compares population level means, meaning the overall mean of a protein in the untreated population 
versus the overall mean of protein abundance in the treated population, whereas the biomarkers focus on the status of an individual subject and they want to predict whether the subject has the disease or not. So this requires different statistical and machine learning technology. So we focus here on differential analysis. A second really important part here is the biological aspect. So what are the conditions that we're interested in? What are the replicates? The replicates are important to handle uncertainty and variation. And we have two layers of uncertainty and two layers of variation. One is biological variation, person to person. We all have different protein abundances between us. We also have different protein abundances from one day to the next or from one time point to the next. We also have noisy measurement technology, which introduces additional noise and variation. And so because of that, we need to characterize whether we have replicates on the same subject across multiple time points, multiple biological subjects, or multiple technical replicate runs on the same biological sample. These aspects will require different statistical analysis. And of course, technological aspects such as sample preparation, label-free, label-based, multiplexed or not, um, the type of data acquisition, DDA versus DIA, the randomization strategy, these are all very important aspects of the experimental design. So here's one example, kind of older experiment that we had. This was our collaborator comparing two uh, breast cancer cell lines. Now these cancer cell lines had ex were exposed to different level of oxygen, like regular oxygen versus low oxygen. Uh, this oxygen exposure was done for different durations. For each duration, there were multiple cell cultures, and for each culture, there were multiple technical replicate runs. Statistical model has to distinguish these different levels of variability, build them cor incorrectly in the model, and make sure that our conclusions reflect the right level of uncertainty. So this is what MS Stats is doing behind the scenes. Here's another example, which is a time course experiment. This was a study on uh, childhood uh, osteosarcoma. So this is a childhood bone cancer. What, it is an example of a hybrid design. So here there were some healthy individuals at one time point, And then there were some diseased individuals which had many time points before the treatment, during chemotherapy, before surgery after surgery, and you could ask questions, uh, is the pro which proteins change in abundance between healthy and disease at diagnosis? Which proteins kind of become more similar to healthy levels after the treatment? Which proteins change primarily after surgery? So this is the type of experimental design, the type of questions that MS stats can answer. And again, it requires a fairly specialized statistical models to reflect different sources of uh, variation. Well, so once the experiment is designed and data are collected, then a really important part is uh, data processing. As I mentioned, we are equal opportunity. We're trying to be as inclusive as possible with various types of uh, data processing tools. The converters uh, pay attention to this type of quality control. However, uh, a lot of these decisions are somewhat heuristic and somewhat subjective. These converters, they have parameters and so on that you can filter things out or keep things out or keep things in. And so it is really important for us to understand what are the implications of these steps of data processing on the final conclusions of statistical analysis. And we do know, I think it's pretty clear that these steps will have implications for the final conclusions. And our goals as statisticians and as developers of MS stats is to make sure that these biological conclusions are as little dependent on this heuristics upstream as possible. And so they reflect the underlying biology as much as possible, and they reflect the specialized heuristic choices we made upstream as little as possible. And this is really one of the main uh, focuses of uh, MS stats. So here's what the input to MS stats looks like. You will see this quite a bit in the hands-on uh, session. Uh, essentially, we have one row per uh, peak intensity or uh, fragment intensity in DIA. And so here is the intensity of the feature. Uh, all these features come from run one. 
this is they all come from the replicate a in condition one so this is if it's a labeled experiment that describes what kind of label there is what is the fragment and product and what is the protein name and uh, peptide sequence uh, for this particular uh, feature you will see this quite a lot and so the goal of ms stats is to take all this evidence which pertains to one particular protein and summarize it in a way which is uh, robust to all of these artifacts, but also reflects the experimental design appropriately. So let me now walk you through a little bit the data processing, and then we will focus on uh, statistical analysis. So as part of data processing and quality control, we would like to do some visualizations and tools such as Skyline and FragPipe do this already, but we also do it on our end as an extra uh, check. And so this is one example of a QC plot that uh, MS stats would generate. So here the x-axis is mass spectrometry run. Um, this particular experiment is a time course with 10 time points and the vertical lines separate time points. The actual order of acquisition was randomized, but now for the purpose of presentation, we reorganize them by condition. Uh, each time point has three replicate mass spectrometry runs. And so the y-axis summarizes in the box plots all the log intensities of every feature, every protein, every peptide in that run. And so what we see is that as time progresses, the intensity goes up And so of all the proteins. And so the question is, is this biology or is this technology? And the answer is it can be either, right? It depends on the experiment. So the plot by itself only tells us that the intensity goes up, but we don't necessarily know why. Now, this particular experiment uh, happens to have labeled reference standards. So now I can tell you more a little bit. It's a targeted experiment, which targeted only a limited number of proteins, which are expected to be affected by a particular stress. And for each endogenous protein of interest, which was targeted, there was a heavy labeled reference counterpart, which was spiked in the biological sample. The reference counterpart is not supposed to have any biology. It was spiked <clears throat> in as constant concentration as possible. And so now, if we do have this type of labeled references, MS stats makes a plot like that, where these are the endogenous intensities here, but these are the labeled reference standards and we see that the labeled reference standards they have some variability this is the technical variation uh, due to the data acquisition but not to the same extent as the endogenous uh, intensity so what ms stats would do it would equalize in the case of labeled references the entire distributions of uh, reference standards and for each run learn the extent of shift and apply this shift to the endogenous intensity and so now we see that indeed this shift in intensity is likely due to the underlying biology and this makes sense because it's a targeted experiment and most proteins will be expected uh, to be changing so using this type of labeled references is uh, very useful uh, the problem with that is that sometimes we cannot necessarily add these labeled references for every step. For, in particular here, these references only reflect the variation which took place during data acquisition. So they do not account for variation due to the digestion or due to sample storage or anything else prior to that. So some of this variability can still be due to artifacts in the samples. Also, we may not necessarily have these standards for various reasons. By the way, just as a parenthesis, this experiment had uh, labeled references for every endogenous protein. It doesn't have to be the case. You just can have like a small number of reference proteins. Um, increasingly, we see that IRT protein, uh, IRT standards, which are spiked for retention time purposes, could be used as uh, references for normalization, provided that they are spiked in a constant concentration. So there are many other ways to find standards. Ideally, there will be some endogenous proteins which we know are not regulated, and those can be used as standards. Unfortunately, I don't know if this such a thing exists because we never know that something is never changing under any circumstances. So that's very hard uh, to assume. Now, 
here we really rely on reference standards because the number of proteins is fairly small. I think it's a couple hundred proteins only. But if we're talking about a DIA experiment, which quantifies, I don't know, 5,000 proteins, it is more reasonable to assume that the majority of the proteins will not be affected by the stress and only a small proportion of the proteins will be affected. In this case, it would be meaningful to equalize, for example, the medians of the endogenous uh, protein abundances, because we can assume that the median intensity is stable. And if we see some changes, it's an artifact of data acquisition. In this case, MSTATS has an option of equalizing the median intensities across all the runs. The choice of normalization, I would say that it's probably the most difficult decision in this type of analysis because it is very hard to be automated. It really depends on the nature of the experiment, on the nature of standards, how many proteins are quantified, how many proteins are expected to be changed by a particular stress. So this is the step which requires most expertise and most care. And I would say that if you see differences in reanalysis of the same data set between publications, very often it's due to this upstream processing and normalization steps. So this is quite important. Okay, and so then after that, we are ready for a statistical analysis and to make long story short for now, the output of the statistical analysis will be uh, fault changes or actually log fault changes. We do everything on the log scale because it has better statistical properties. So log fault changes uh, and uh, p-values. Log fault changes, uh, this is what we call them as uh, practical significance. Um, it is fine to say I am not interested in anything that is doesn't have at least a two-fold change or whatever cutoff you want to use. However, log-fold change alone is not a good criterion on whether this change that we observe is more systematic than what we expect to see by random chance. Uh, we need to compare this um, fold change to the extent of the underlying biological and technological variation, and p-values allow us to summarize that. So here, p-values are adjusted for multiple testing. I will talk about this in a minute. And traditionally, we take the negative log transform of this adjusted p-values so that high values means more statistical significance. So we are interested in the upper left and upper right corner of this comparison plot. So vertical lines uh, delineate the full change cutoff, it's fine to apply it as long as we apply the statistical significance cutoff corresponding to the false discovery rate of whatever you chose before analyzing the data. Now, if we have more than one comparison, let's say we have a time course just as before with 10 time points, when we compare time point two to time point one, time point three to time point one and so on. So we can visualize this in this type of a heat map um, the Y or, or the columns, I guess, in this heat map are comparisons in time. The rows are individual proteins and the color is the um, p-value. So it means that uh, blue is significantly uh, down, uh, red is significantly up, uh, black is no change. It can kind of give us the pattern of changes across multiple uh, time points. So this is the type of visualization we do. And, and of course, uh, the last thing is we would need to talk about experimental design so that now that we learn how much biological and technological variation is in the data, we can plan um, the sample size for future experiments or allocation of resources. So now let me tell you a little bit about t-test and p-values. I know that many of you have seen that and are familiar with that, but I also noticed that frequently we use these terms without really kind of being on the same page of what it actually means. And just for the sake of making sure that MS stats is used for the right question, I will go ahead and review very briefly t-test, p-values, and multiple testing, just to make sure we are on the same page. And then I will talk about more specifically about MS stats for DIE. So first, this is not MS stats. This is a very kind of classical standard uh, t-test, 
So imagine a label-free experiment, which is really, really simple. So that we have for one healthy individual for this protein, we only have one peak. And here is one disease individual. And for this protein, we only also have one peak. So we want to know if this peak is changing in abundance or in intensity between healthy and disease more systematically than by random chance. We, if we now have multiple replicates, we can visualize this like this. These are healthy subjects. And so this is the log of the abundance of this peak across multiple replicates for the healthy. And this is the log of the abundance uh, for the disease. And so our question is whether yes or no, on average in the population, the abundance of the healthy is the same as the abundance of the disease. So this is what I would like to emphasize. We are comparing the averages of uh, protein abundances in the entire underlying populations. Now, if the protein is changing on average, it doesn't mean that it has good predictive power for one person. But in terms of screening uh, many proteins uh, for their relevance to a disease, or in terms of just doing basic science and understanding what is affected by the stress, this is totally appropriate. And so that's what we would want to do. Now, the problem about the populations is that whatever the mean in the entire population of millions of subjects uh, who are healthy and millions of subjects who are diseased, we never know what their, expect, what, what their population mean is. We will never know what it is, but we can make guesses, right? So we can assume something. And so what is easy to assume for us is that on average in the underlying populations, the two uh, protein abundances are the same. There is a convention in statistics that we use Greek letters such as mu for things that we never observe. So in large populations, we never know what the protein abundances are. Let's say mu one is the population mean for the healthy, mu two is the population mean for the disease. We don't know what they are, but let's just make a wild guess and say that they are the same. So the difference is zero. And this is what is called the null hypothesis. So we hypothesize that. And then the alternative is that, well, it's something else, right? So there is indeed a regulation. So those two uh, means are not uh, the same. So now we do not know what this uh, population means are. What we do have is several measurements we take on some subjects selected from the healthy population and some measurements selected from the subjects uh, selected from the disease uh, population. And so now we'll try to summarize what we have and what we observe and make and use this to make conclusions about what we do not observe. So this is what statistical inference actually means, is to take what we observe, summarize it, and make statements about what we cannot observe. So what we observe is a few replicates from each condition. What we do not observe is what happens in the entire population. But let's try to make some statements. So for that, what we do is essentially we build the signal to noise ratio. Our signal is the difference between the group means. So we do not know what happens in the entire population, but we know what the means are in our data. So this will be the mean in the first group versus the mean in the second group. And the noise is how much variation we expect to see for each of those uh, two means. And so now this is a little bit tricky, so I'll just take uh, a minute for that. So this S1 square and S2 square, these are just variances in the populations, right? So sample variances, this is how we calculate them. Um, the deviations from the mean squared summarized over all the data, right? So this is the sample variance that we see in the first population. This is sample variance that we see in the second population. This is fine, except that this is not quite what we need because we want to know how confident we are in this mean versus how confident we are in this mean. So it's not the same. So the process for that is like, like this. So let's say we have a normal population. Let's say we have three replicates. We take three replicates, we calculate the mean. Then we go back we take three more replicates from this population, calculate the mean. We go back, we take some other three replicates, calculate the mean. So these histograms, this will be the histograms of the means of three subjects that we take repeatedly from this population. So you see that this histogram is narrower than the original histogram 
from which we collected the data. Now, if our sample size is larger, let's say here, sample size is 20, we take 20 samples from this population, calculate the mean. We take 20 other subjects from the population, calculate the mean, and then do the histogram of the means, we see that this histogram is even narrower. So the variability or the spread of this histogram of the means is called standard error. So standard error tells us how much uncertainty or how much reproducibility we have in the mean of our data if we were to repeatedly go back and collect the data and repeat the experiments. So this will be the, <clears throat> the spread of this histogram for the first population. This is the spread of this histogram for the second population. The square root is the overall uncertainty associated with our signal. So one thing, if you are to talk to statisticians for whatever reason, make sure you are clear with the difference between standard deviation and standard error. So standard deviation tells us about how much variation we have in the population. Standard error tells us how confident we are in the mean of the population. And so, by the way, let me also kind of preempt the question. Maybe there is a question like that. So my data kind of look normal here, right, my cartoon. And oftentimes people say, yeah, but mass spec data are not normal. It has outliers, it has some skewness and so on. Is it a problem? Well, turns out that when we're interested in the means of the data and not in the actual populations, it's much less of a problem. So here you see very different distributions like skewed, uniform, irregular. And with, like, let's look at this one, really weird distribution. And we repeat the same exercise, right? We take three, three replicates, take, calculate the mean, three other replicates calculate the mean and so on. Plot the histogram of these means, you see that it's much more bell-shaped than the original uh, distribution. And if we increase the sample size, it's even more bell-shaped. So the means themselves and their uncertainty is much more normally distributed than the original population. This is called central limit theorem. And this is what allows us to oftentimes make the assumptions of normal distribution regarding the means, even if the data themselves are not quite uh, bell-shaped. This said, you see that if we start from the normal distribution, those means are much more reproducible for 20 replicates than if we start with something irregular. So there is an advantage when our starting population is closer to normal. This is why we take a log transformation of the data so that the starting point uh, is closer to normal distribution. Okay, so let me just review, right? So we assume that there is no difference between the two population means, or this is the null hypothesis, or maybe there is a difference between the means, that's the alternative. And so we built a signal to noise from what we observe. So now we need to take what we observe and make some statements about what we cannot see, so about our null hypothesis. How can we actually do that? Well, turns out that if our data are normally distributed, and if in fact the null hypothesis is true, so this assumption actually verifies. Then we can show mathematically without any additional you know, experimentation, what would be the plausible range of the signal to noise ratio. And this plausible range takes a form of another probability distribution. It's called the student distribution. It's very similar to normal, just a little bit uh, heavier tails. So let me repeat that. So if there is no difference between the population means, then I can tell you what is the range of values that I expect to see for this signal to noise ratio. So this is this particular distribution. And so now what I can do, I can actually overlay what I observe on top of this distribution and say, is it consistent with what I expect to see or not? So if the signal to noise, I put it on top of this distribution and it's somewhere in the middle, you say, yeah, well, that's what I kind of expected to see if there was no difference between uh, protein abundances. So yeah, there is no contradiction with my assumption of no change. On the other hand, if I overlay this on this distribution and it's somewhere very far away from what I expect to see, you say, wait a minute, it doesn't agree. So my values are very different from what I expect. What can be wrong? Well, one thing that can be, can be wrong is that we assume that there is no difference between the two populations when in reality there is one. So if every other assumption is correct, then it means that I reject the null hypothesis. One additional assumption I forgot to mention is that we assume that each of these data points are independent. 
So there's no brothers and sisters in our data set, that there is no kind of some other types of similarities which are um, hidden. So if these assumptions verify, then we can say that we can reject the null hypothesis is the, if the observed signal to noise is not consistent with what we expect. So the last piece is, okay, well, but how large is large? So how far in the tail should I be to claim that there is a evidence against the null hypothesis? And this is where the probabilistic interpretation is helpful because this is a probability distribution. So the area under this curve corresponds to the probability. So we can specify alpha, which is a false positive rate. It's the probability of false positive. So probability of rejecting the null hypothesis when we shouldn't. So if we specify it, for example, at 5%, then we say if my observed signal to noise is in the tail, then I have 5% of chance of rejecting the null hypothesis when I shouldn't have. And so the value of this statistical analysis and making assumptions is really in this error rate, making decisions and being able to quantify how often you can be wrong in these decisions. So false positive rate is one way to quantify um, how wrong we can be. And so the related concept is the p-value. Now I actually overlay literally uh, this observed signal to noise ratio. And I also overlay the negative kind of counterpart. And the p-value is the area under the curve to the left and to the right of the observed uh, p-values. And so if the p-value is less than alpha, this is another way to say that my observed signal to noise is too extreme. And so if the p-value is less than alpha, then I reject uh, the null hypothesis. So that's really all there is in terms of like statistics and uh, hypothesis testing. Well, I hope that the, uh, the co-presenters can answer some of the questions which come up. And if I need to uh, stop and emphasize something, please and don't hesitate to interrupt me if there are other open questions. Uh, let me also talk a little bit about multiple testing because this also comes up and I want to kind of clarify what the false discovery rate adjustment is uh, about. Uh, you probably know if you have been working with uh, peptide identification and database searches, you probably have heard about the FDR control at the peptide and PSM and peptide and protein identification stage. So this is not what we're talking about here. Our input takes these identifications these methods take these identifications as input and kind of set it aside. And now we want to uh, focus on the error rates of detecting changes in abundance. Of course, all of those error rates accumulate, but the state of the art currently is to separately control FDR at the identification stage and separately control FDR at the quantification stage. There have been methods attempting to combine that. And I think there is a value in that. The problem is that computation of these problems become very difficult to scale uh, to large data sets and to complex designs. So for the moment, kind of the default strategy in most experiments is to separately control FDR at the identification quantification. So this is what's going on. So remember the signal to noise I just talked about, right? Uh, to test the hypothesis. So this was for the case of one protein. Um, now, what if we have two proteins in the data set? So we will have to repeat this procedure separately for protein one and then separately for protein two. So here I'm trying to visualize this. I just flip this distribution. So this was my reference distribution for protein one. And this is the reference distribution for protein two. For protein one, this is my rejection region. So this is the region when my observed signal to noise is too large and indicates the evidence against the null hypothesis. And so I reject the null hypothesis for protein one, regardless of what happens for protein two. So this red areas here together, they, they're alpha, right? So they have 5% or something like that. So that's fine. But now I do the same thing for protein two, right? So for protein two, I'm comparing signal to noise for protein two against the same area. And I reject the null hypothesis for protein two, if again, I am in this red area, regardless of what happens for the first protein. Now, the problem is that we have both proteins in our experiment, right? So the actual possibility of making, 
of rejecting the null hypothesis, so claiming that something is changing when we shouldn't, is actually a combination of these two areas. And if we combine these areas, well, together they're greater than alpha. So the probability of making at least one false positive decision regarding changes in abundance is larger than what we would like to claim. So it's larger than alpha. And of course, our experiments do not have two proteins. They have thousands of proteins. So the probability of making at least one false positive decision is essentially one. So we're guaranteed to, if we try hard enough and test long enough, we always find something just by random chance. So it is very easy to have a lot of false positives just by testing enough proteins. So what this means is that we have to be more careful, right? And being more careful here really means more conservative, right? So for example, if we change the decision boundary as shown with this dashed line and only rejected the null hypothesis, if we are in this outside region of this dashed line, then we could make sure that the area outside of the dashed line is 5% or uh, whatever we want it to be. Now, the problem is that we see that now we push the decision boundary far, far back, and it means that now it requires a much stronger signal to noise, so much stronger evidence against the null hypothesis to claim differential abundance. And the more proteins we have, the more conservative we have to be. Uh, in particular, you probably have heard about Bonferroni approach for multiple testing. So Bonferroni takes this alpha, divides by two, and then divides by the number of proteins you have to have a super strong evidence, super large signal to noise to claim differential abundance. Because of course, the best way to not make any false positives is to not find anything. Then we're fine, right? But that's not what we would like to do. So essentially we have to be very careful about how we control for this multiple testing without being too conservative. And so some, 15 or so years ago, there have been a shift in mindset in the statistical literature saying that, well, maybe instead of trying to push the decision boundary too far back, we can change the criteria. So here, the combined red area says, we want to make sure that the probability of at least one false positive is very small. When we test 5,000 proteins, maybe that's too much to ask. So maybe we're okay having some false positives as long as we control their proportion in the data set. And so this is how currently people think about this. So this is the truth. This is how many true non-differentially abundant proteins we have. This is how many true differentially abundant proteins we have. This is our decision. We claim no change. Here we claim the change. The problem is that only this number R is actually observed. We do not know what these numbers are. We do not know what these numbers are. However, there are statistical procedures which allows us to uh, control the average proportion of false positives in the list of proteins which we claim are changing. So it allows us to control V, the ratio of V divided by R. Well, we usually find at least something. So it's V uh, over R. The previous approach, Bonferroni and others I mentioned, would really control that V is anything other than zero with a very small probability. Now we're saying, okay, fine, we will have some false positives, but we want to control the proportion of these false positives in the list that we claim as differentially abundant. And so this is a different criterion. And the method that Emma Stutz is using uh, is called Benjamin and Hogberg. So we can um, either change the decision boundary as I was showing here, or we can transform the p values so that we can plot them on the volcano plot. This is quite standard and many uh, packages rely on that. It's numerically very robust. So that's what uh, MS stats is using. So uh, feel free to ask questions about that. But currently, if you look at the FDR adjusted p-value cutoff, it means that the proportion of the average proportion of false positives in the list of claimed changes is uh, as specified. So if we select the cutoff at 5%, then um, we expect 5% false positives in our list. Okay, and maybe now this is a good time to also mention again the experimental design. So one thing I would like to emphasize, and this is what uh, MS Stats is uh, paying attention to, is how the sample size um, depends 
on the number of proteins that we test and on how many proteins are expected to be changing. So let me just, well, first of all, this is the type of figure that MSTAS generates. So this is the fold change that we would like to detect. This is number of replicates that we would need to have to be able to detect this fold change, given the variability, biological and technological variability we have seen in the past data sets. So this is what we would expect in the future data set. So if we have only one feature or one protein, so this will be the sample size. However, if we have more proteins, we would need larger sample size and the sample size will depend on what kind of proteins. So here, the uh, dotted line corresponds to a more targeted experiment where expect half of the proteins to be truly changing. So this would require a smaller sample size. And this top line corresponds to a more discovery protein where we, where we quantify more proteins and we expect only a small number of them to be changing. We need a larger sample size. This may be somewhat counterintuitive, but let's just remember, right, what happened with this multiple testing procedure. We try to protect ourselves against false positives. So in a targeted experiment, there will be more true positives. So there will be less opportunity for false positives. In a discovery experiment, there will be potentially more proteins which are not changing and fewer true positives. If we have fewer true positives, we have more chance for false positives. And so we need to work harder to protect ourselves against that. And work harder in this context means having a larger sample size. So this is another way to think about discovery versus confirmatory targeted experiments that discover the more we can exploring and the less we know about our data, the more sample size we need to have to ensure the same control of our error rates. Alternatively, we can have a smaller sample size and have larger error rates. And this is fine too, if this is what is acceptable for our experiments. So the goal for us is not necessarily to request a large sample size, but more to understand the trade-offs between the type of the experiment and the type of false positives and false negatives potentially that we can have. So that's how MS Stats thinks about all of these uh, problems. So now we have uh, half an hour left. So now I can actually tell you a little bit about the methods implemented in MS Stats, and there is a lot. So just like you know, last week we had our speakers who had to skip over many details, we will have to do that too. So I will just have a few vignettes which hopefully convince you that it's worthwhile working with specialized methods um, for our data as opposed to some generic methods which are available in R or in Bioconductor or in Excel for that matter. Okay, so the first point I would like to make is that the specialized methods in MS stats focus on between two reproducibility so that our conclusions express more the biology and less the choice of data processing tool which we selected upstream. So here is uh, some fairly uh, old uh, DIA data sets, but the same point remains currently for uh, more recent data. There are three data sets, uh, two data sets here. Uh, one is the uh, DDA data set by Jurgen Cox from the original LFQ paper. This is the DIA Bruder uh, data set. Uh, Brendan talked about this data set uh, last week. Uh, this, each data set is processed by Skyline, by MaxQuant in this case, Spectronaut in this case, and also by Progenesis in this case. And this is the work by uh, Mina Choi. So what we see here is that this gray histograms, they're actually histograms, they summarize the log intensity of everything in this data set. So across all runs, across all proteins, across all features, charges, everything. And the x-axis are the same uh, in both cases. So what we see already is just that the location of the histograms changes, right? So different tools report these abundances on different scales which is not a problem because we do not interpret the abundance by itself. We interpret changes in abundances between conditions. And so if a tool quantifies the peak by truncating the tails or by the peak apex, of course it will affect the intensity which is reported. 
And the more interestingly, let's take a look at the number of peaks. So 203,000 for Skyline, 224,000 for Max Quant, 56,000 for Progenesis. Big differences. Uh, here, 1,000 zeros, here is no zeros. Here is 600 zeros. Here is 33 missing values. Here is 38,000 missing values. There are big differences between the tools. Now, this is the number of zeros by Skyline, and this is the number of zeros with uh, Max Quant, for example. So this means that besides just reporting the intensity of a feature and the differences in that, the tools in particular make very different decisions when things are challenging. So when you have peaks where, that are close to the noise in the data, um, you can call them zeros, you can call them NAs, you can call them small values, which you can quantify the noise in the expected area of the peak. Uh, sometimes, for example, Skyline distinguishes, so the Skyline uses NA when the peak is present but can't be quantified. For example, um, the peak has an, a strong overlap with another peak or it's truncated, this, the window is, has cut the peak for, for like in the big part. Uh, otherwise, it will probably integrate the area in the expected region. Max Quant seems to be much more generous with NA and has a lot more NA than uh, Skyline has. And so what we realized when we worked with all of these data processing tools is that we should not be interpreting this type of readouts literally, because sometimes the same pattern in the data is represented in very different ways by different tools. And they have their reasons, they, and sometimes they emphasize certain things. But if we want to make sure that our statistical conclusions are not that dependent on these choices, we need to read between the lines and understand what was the intention by the tool and try to summarize things um, as statistically appropriate as possible. So what we decided to do back then is to essentially not pay attention to zeros versus NAs versus low values, and we came up with this cutoff, which is data set specific, where we say below this cutoff, we don't trust the values. So call them small values, zeros, NA. We essentially assume that below this cutoff, um, the intensities are not reliable and we should do something else about them than just using them naively. And this cutoff is very simple. It's we look at the median, we look at the uh, 97th quantile, deviation from the median to the right, we flip this distance to the left. So it's very simple heuristic, but we're saying that this is uh, the cutoff for the data set below which we do not trust uh, the values. And so now this is how we think about this kind of from the statistical perspective. This is one protein in this data set. We think about this uh, in terms of this data structure. Columns here are mass spectrometry runs. Again, remember it's label free. And so, each, like several runs can be grouped because they're technical replicates on the same subject. The subjects can be grouped because they're biological replicates of a condition, and then we can have multiple conditions. Alternatively, we can have a time course or repeated measurements experiment. Now then this subject from condition one will be the same as the subject from condition two. This is where MS stats requires a convention where each biological replicate has a unique identifier. If you have subject one profiled across multiple conditions or multiple time points, MS stats will see that and will recognize that we have repeated measurements or time course design. On the other hand, if each condition has distinct subject IDs, which are not the same, then we will recognize that this is a group comparison design and we do not have repeated measurements. And MS stats will, do, will fit the right model for that. So the pink part of this data structure is essentially biology, right? And the experimental design that we have. Now the yellow part is the technology. In each run, we acquire multiple features. And this Y here is the log intensity of this feature. And then for some features, we have missing values and some features are below this cutoff. In statistical language, it's called sensory. And so now our goal is to summarize this data structure and do statistical testing in a way that where we build the single to noise ratio, but in a more smart way where we understand what the nature of replication is. 
we rep represent peak intensities and read between the lines and say these are the values which should be censored. And also, well, some of these features has, have outliers and so on, and we need to be robust uh, to that. Uh, if we have statisticians in the audience, just as a parenthesis, this is how traditionally we think about this type of data structure. So this is called a split plot design where randomization occurs. We randomize the order of the runs at the columns. So in the pink part of the data structure, and then the features that we, that we have, they affect the intensities that we observe, but they're not randomized. All the features are acquired simultaneously within the run. Because there's a restriction on randomization, we have two parts of this experimental design that we need to handle separately. And in the classical statistical literature, there is this type of general model, which is called a split plot model, which we can write. And if we had no missing values, no outliers, no um, every, every subject has the same number of replicates and so on, then it can be shown that conclusions regarding the biology, so comparisons between conditions, only depend on some kind of summary of all the features in the run. So we only need to understand the run level values to do the statistical uh, inference, which gave us a thought that a two-step procedure where which first summarizes all the features in the run uh, and then focuses on the pink part of these data structures is uh, more uh, effective. And you know, this is not a novel idea. Many people summarize features in the run and then do hypothesis, but being able to put it in the context of a more general statistical literature helps us make extensions which are much more robust and handle extreme cases uh, in much more reliably. So specifically what we do, we first focus on this yellow part of the data structure and we say, okay, if uh, some of these things were censored, we have this indicator saying that we have a missing value, but the missing value is informative, meaning it's small. If it is missing, but it's not randomly missing, it is missing for reasons of low abundance. And then it allows us to summarize this type of data structure uh, in a manner which is very classical kind of statistical uh, way that handles censored uh, data. If you are familiar with this, you know, you can recognize this. If not, all we need to do to, to say is that we know that the features are uh, missing for reasons of low abundance. What I can do though, is I can give you the intuition of what's going on uh, with this type of summary. So let's say we have two mass spectrometry runs. Let's say this is healthy and this is disease. And let's say that this protein has three features. This is what would happen if we could quantify all three features in every run. So this will be the average of the healthy. This will be the average of the disease. We'll say, okay, that's how the protein is regulated. Now let's say that this is the limit of quantification and this particular feature cannot be quantified if we have, uh, if the protein is at low abundance. So we have some choices. So for example, we can leave it missing. So then we will summarize what we observe in the healthy and then summarize what we observe in the disease. We see how we would underestimate the effect of regulation because we only we tend to have higher values observed and ignore that the lower value was missing. So we underestimate the effect of regulation and we can even not be able to say that this protein is differentially abundant. What we can also do, we can impute with zero over some other small value or integrate the noise in the data. Then we will overestimate the extent of regulation, right? Because now one of the values is smaller than it should have been. And so now this can potentially lead to false positives. So what MSTATS is doing, and this is what this kind of mathematics really imply, is that we assume that the features supposed to be parallel because they come from the same protein. We expect all these features to be um, following the same pattern. And so for this missing value, if we have other features present in this run, and if we have this particular feature present in some other runs, then we essentially propagate this kind of by parallel pattern. We say this value is imputed. And so now we estimate the missing value more accurately. So this is what this imputation actually is. And then we will summarize this. And instead of taking the mean, we use a robust summarization to account for outliers. And so now after we have done this summarization, we have this simplified data structure where for each run, we have one number per protein. 
And so now that we have one number per protein, we can go back to the biological aspects of experimental design and focus on what is the type of replicates, what is the type of conditions, how can we uh, build essentially the signal to noise ratio to have uh, the most accurate p-values. So that's what MSTATS is doing. And there have been uh, a lot of benchmarking. MENA in particular has done a lot of work benchmarking this against various methods. This particular figure in illustrates how this imputation plus robust summarization by Twiki Median Polish allows us to have accurate estimation. So this is one of the uh, controlled mixtures where we know the true fold change. This is a particular protein. So the true fold change uh, is uh, two. So the true log fold change is one. And so this is what happens with the estimation if we have, and for two data processing tools. And so this is what happens if we uh, ignore imputation or if we ignore robust summarization. Uh, this is what happens if we just take the sum of the features without doing kind of the statistically kind of complicated, more sophisticated things that we do. And so fundamentally, uh, the number of comparisons and the estimations are more accurately if we do that. Now, to preempt uh, questions. So we have noticed something more recently that this type of assumptions is not always the right thing to do. For example, if you have um, post-translational modifications, and this is the work by Devon more recently, uh, then we may not have enough data to do this type of imputation. It may also be possible that in PTM, the missing values are not necessarily due to low abundance. They may be due just to the enrichment step not working. So the protein, the PTM is there, but it just was not captured by the enrichment step. So uh, there are clearly situations when assuming that missing values are due to reasons of low abundance is not appropriate. As I was saying earlier, max quant is very generous with missing values. So those missing values may come from other situations. Well, we always have options just to leave missing NA, in which case we will have something like this. Um, I would say more work is needed, especially for this more recent workflows and PTMs and so on. So we will be certainly working on that. For now, this type of imputation is an option. So you can use it or you can leave it out uh, if you would like. But in terms of benchmarking, let me get back to that. So uh, this is three data sets, which are all spike in mixtures where we know the ground truth. And this is uh, for each data set, we process this either with MS stats or just taking the sum of all the intensities of the features and then taking the log. And so what we're interested in is in reproducibility of the conclusions between the tools. Remember in the beginning, I said, we want to make sure that our conclusions reflect the sample composition, reflect the biology and not the technology. And so what is good to see is that if we use this type of analysis with MS stats, the intersection of true positives between the tools is higher than the intersection if we just take the sum of the features and take the logs. And the same in terms of the false positives, we minimize the false positives compared to log sum. So these are three data sets, but we've done quite a bit more and we're yet to see a data set where this is not the case. So the conclusion from this part is that if we interpret the data kind of more smartly and read between the lines, our conclusions become less dependent on the specific choice of the data processing tool that uh, we use. So this is, uh, this is the first part. And now the remaining ones, I just take 15 minutes to uh, just walk you briefly through uh, some other um, functionalities that we have. So the um, differences in data processing. So this was um, also uh, very useful uh, for us to see. So uh, this is the case study with um, a DIA case study, which you will actually work with in the hands-on uh, right after the break. Let, and you already worked uh, to some extent with Brandon uh, last week. Let me just review a little bit what was done for uh, this particular uh, experiment. So uh, this was yeast samples exposed to osmotic stress. So the stress where yeast is progressively starved. 
Uh, there were six time points, three biological replicates per time point, so 18 DIA ones. And there were two analyses done by Skyline. The first one, just kind of traditional analysis, where we, for each precursor, we will select top six fragments and we keep everything. And then what is interesting in this data set, and that's why we like to use it for teaching also, is that the authors also did something else. Uh, they had a separate experiment where they had eight technical uh, DIA runs of a same sample to essentially understand how reproducibly and consistently they can quantify the same thing. And so from this technical refinement runs, what they did, they selected peptide precursors which were detected consistently. So detected in more than 50% of the runs and also had low CV, so CV less than 20%. And so now we have a choice. Either we quantify everything we see or we rely on this type of uh, additional filtering based on prior experiment to only keep quote unquote good quality data. And so the question is, does it matter? Should we do this refinement runs or should we somehow otherwise make sure that our data are uh, good quality? And then after that, so we processed in Skyline, regular low CV, the data were also processed with Spectronaut and uh, back then with DIA Empire. After that, we used consistent downstream statistical analysis with MS stats, but having this additional Q filter, so quality of the identification um, cutoff. So this is a comparison between the data sets. So this is when we work with all the precursors, and this is where we only work with precursors which have low CV. Well, it's a real life experiment. We do not know what the truth is. We do not know what to expect, but a couple points to note. So low CV clearly left, uh, lost some proteins. We have 400 proteins fewer, but we can also see that for all the data sets, the patterns of changes in time across uh, as compared to time zero is kind of jumpy, right? So it goes from 74 proteins to 300, then to 519 then down to 500, that up to 700. Whereas with low CV, things are much more consistently progressing. 58, 260, 373, 465, 700. I would argue that biology is more likely to be kind of smooth and consistent rather than jumping up and down. And so even though we lost some proteins, I'm guessing that this is probably more reliable than uh, this type of differential abundance. Now, if we focus on a particular time point, we compare time 60 versus zero. Well, uh, quite a bit of agreement between them, but also some uh, proteins were detected as changing only with all precursors and some only with low CV. So it matters, right? The data processing matters. And this is one particular protein. And so we see what happens, right? So if we have low CV data, well, there's an outlier, but MS stats can handle this outlier easily, right, with this data processing. Whereas here, well, there's a lot more outliers, which will be somehow, you know, eliminated or imputed. So it's a more difficult um, situation. And so we see that uh, because of that, the conclusions actually change, right? So in this particular case, uh, using all precursors, the protein is borderline significant, but then if you use, um, good quality data, then you say, yeah, maybe not such a strong evidence for change. So what's, uh, what's the right answer, right? We, we do not know, it's hard to tell. But this, definitely, uh, but this definitely matters. But now thinking about comparing for the same data set across different uh, tools, uh, we also see the same thing that the agreement between the tools. So this is one particular protein quantified by three different tools. Um, DIA Empire, uh, we probably should not give much weight to that because frag pipe is much better now. Back then it was not designed for this type of instruments, right? But we see that the nature of quantification between Skyline and Spectronaut is somewhat different. And we see that regardless, the agreement between tools between the tools is much higher if we do the processing with MS stats as compared to the processing with taking the sum and then uh, taking the log. So again, by handling outliers, the difference between um, the difference between the tools is um, smaller. 
So this is one uh, this is one vignette. So we can kind of work with the data processing matters. Uh, some extent of outliers we can handle, in which case we have less uh, differences between the tools. However, there's no magic, and some of the upstream data processing definitely has impact on our conclusions. So this observation, particularly with this data set, motivated another project in the lab where we asked ourselves, do we have to have this low refinement runs to understand what it means to have quality data? Or can we somehow learn what it means to have quality data computationally without having to do additional experimentation? And so this is now the next step for that. And so this was uh, a, a separate uh, work. So this is, so the data is still by Brendan and Min. I think I have uh, the acknowledgement. Yes, this is the paper by Tsung Heng Tsai, which was published a couple of years ago in MCP. So that's what was the thought process. So let's kind of continue with this low CV data set and try to uh, add another option of uh, data processing. So we had four data sets, uh, which were resulted from different processing of the original data. So full sparse means we consider all precursors, use six fragments per precursor, and we only eliminate individual peaks if they do not pass the Q value quality of identification threshold. Or we can have full data set again, all precursors, six fragments. And if half of the peaks in the feature do not pass the Q value cutoff, eliminate the entire feature, right? So now here, essentially, we have more features, more missing values. Here we have fewer features and just remove the entire feature if it has too many missing values. And the same thing for low CV. Now let's just take this quote unquote good quality precursors and just introduce some missing values if there is a problem with Q value cutoff. And then let's eliminate the entire features if they do not pass the um, Q value cutoff. And well, it does matter. So in terms of the number of proteins, so clearly uh, low CV and removing entire features makes us lose more proteins compared to full sparse. But full sparse will have more missing values and more noise, right? So somewhere there, uh, there is some kind of middle ground where we need to keep just the right amount of good quality data and not eliminate too much. And so the question was, how can we computationally find what's this middle ground and hopefully make our conclusions less dependent on this type of subjective choices? So this is what the data look like. So this was full sparse. You see that those empty circles, they indicate missing values and we have a lot of outliers because the uh, fragments are not quantified reliably. Uh, here is when we remove some of the features with too many missing values, you see that it becomes cleaner. And this is the low CV sparse. So now more uh, outliers are eliminated just because we know that these are good quality data from prior experimentation. And we also see that, well, it certainly matters in terms of detecting differential abundant proteins. So uh, for example, comparing the first time point, we see that it varies from 58 to 147 differential abundant proteins, right? And here it also varies, let's say time point number four from 500 to 800, right? So that's also quite a big difference. And this is the same processing with MSTAT, so same statistical analysis. So these are really the differences due to the upstream data processing. And so the question for us was, how can we make sure that this happens as little as possible? How can we computationally clean this up so that we rely on a good quality data without requiring additional experiments? So this was the work by Tsung Heng. Uh, he had a pipeline, which is now part of the MSTATS software implementation. So the first thing is he detects uh, low coverage features. So here, uh, we said, okay, 50% missing means low coverage, we remove. But why 50%? Maybe it's 40%, maybe it's 60%. So uh, Tsung Heng was looking at the distributions of missing values in the data set and using kind of more objective statistical arguments to say, this is to make more features, more missing values in these features than we would expect on average in this experiment. So these features have low coverage, whereas these other features have missing values, but it's consistent with the rest of the data. 
we should not remove it. Then uh, what we need to do is to estimate the protein profile on average. So what do we expect in, in some robust way? What do we expect for this protein in general from the available data? And from this profile, we can find what are the individual outlying values. Now that we can also again using some statistical argument. Now that we detected missing values and outliers, there is an additional um, argument to say these features are overall too noisy, right? They have outliers, they have larger noise than what we expect. So we essentially look at the distributions of variances of the individual features. And this allows us to eliminate features with low coverage, eliminate, detect outliers, and detect features which are overall too noisy computationally. Now, let me also kind of say right away, so we tried this and because MSTATS works with different acquisitions, we had to try it with different acquisitions. We tried this with DIA, DDA, and SRM. This type of workflow works best with DIA because we have a lot of features to learn protein profiles, to learn this, how much variation we expect to see, and so on. With DDA, it works to some extent uh, if we have enough features in the protein. For SRM or like targeted experiments with few features, the main benefit really is kind of like finding individual peaks, which are outliers or data curation. It complements manual data curation, but I would say it's most useful uh, for DIA. And so here is the uh, example. So this is for a uh, individual protein again, that's what we looked at. Now, this is how our conclusions become more robust to these choices of filtering, right? So this is if we use all the features. So we see that for a comparing time two versus time zero, depending how you process the data, there will be different uh, proteins claimed as differentially abundant. And we see that now with this extra cleanup, the intersection between different methods is much larger. Meaning with this cleanup, it doesn't, it doesn't matter as much how you choose this processing parameters, you will have a high agreement. It's still not the same, data processing still matters, but at least we have less dependency on the subjective choices of uh, uh, data processing upstream. And the same question as before, so does it how does it depend on the choice of data processing tools, not just like the filtering parameters, but the actual data processing tools. Here is, again, uh, for one of the uh, data sets processed with four different tools, um, gray is the number of features per protein before filtering, orange is how many features we kept after filtering. So for all the tools, the number of features was reduced to some extent. And so now this is the agreement between the tools. If we use all the features, this is what happens if we use top three features, it's less agreement. This is if what, what happens if we have used top 10 features, more or less the same, but the agreement is higher if we use this type of intelligent uh, filtering and data-driven uh, filtering. So again, this type of data cleanup make us less dependent on the choice of the data processing tool. And so the last thing, it's, it's, very, it's kind of very brief, uh, just to talk about the utility of these converters. So you can see already that because we have converters from multiple tools, it is easy for us to use standardized analysis and try different analysis strategies on different outputs and understand what can be done statistically versus what should be improved at the tool level. By the way, I need to mention that Mina has been interacting with all the developers of all these tools. And in the process, I think we debugged a lot of these tools as well because we would find some mistakes or they would be interested in knowing why certain proteins behave certain way for their particular tool. And so because of these converters, we can compare not just the tools, but we can also compare various statistical methods. And we start doing this. We haven't quite finished that yet. But there, of course, MSTATS is not the only tool out there. There are many other tools. So some tools that we found in the literature which do certain things that MSTATS does, I would say that MSTATS is the most general of all in terms of the inputs that we take, compatibility with data processing tools, but also in terms of experimental designs that we can handle. And for that reason, by the way, MSTATS is more or less the default strategy now in both Pride and Massive because of the versatility of the analysis. Uh, 
And uh, let me actually uh, advertise right away, the day after tomorrow, we'll have a discussion of all these repositories and how we can work with historical quantitative data. But for now, I can just say that it's, it allows us to compare uh, MSTAT strategy also the strategies by other statistical analysis methods in terms of um, various techniques. So here we look at the positive predictive uh, value. We can look in terms of the true positives and false positives. We can look into this in details if you would like, but uh, long story short, it's not uniformly superior, but more generally MSTATS is the most versatile and the most accurate tool of all across the board. There are some individual circumstances when it's not the case, but generally speaking, um, it does very well. And so uh, the same thing in terms of false positives and false negatives, we can say, okay, how across different tools, uh, how is the intersection? So we don't necessarily have the larger intersection as compared to the other statistical methods, but it is typically compensated by the smaller false positives. So not necessarily the most sensitive, but more sensitive tools will also have more uh, false positives. So that when we develop our methods, we need to balance the sensitivity with um, false positive rate. So I'll have, I'm happy to talk more about this, either answering Q&A uh, in the chat or um, just offline after that as well. So this is pretty much the end of uh, our hour. So let me just finish by acknowledging a lot of people who contributed to all of this project. So, I again would like to highlight Mina, who was really the leader of all of this effort for a very long time. Uh, Ting, who has done work on the um, TMT-based labeling, we'll talk about this tomorrow. Uh, Cyril has worked on asset characterization. Manaza and Devon have done a lot of work, Devon for PTM and Manaza and Devon together on the Shiny uh, interface. Um, Sung Heng, who did a lot of work on this uh, feature selection work. And of course, Mateusz, who is currently the lead developer. So a lot of the efficiencies in data processing and in modeling are all due to Mateusz's effort. And of course, I would like to, ask, to, to thank the collaborators from ETH, from University of uh, Washington, from Roche and from Genentech, because their feedback and from UCSD, their feedback really has driven a lot of our work. So thank you very much. I am happy to uh, answer questions if uh, there is anything that I should answer maybe live uh, with everyone. If not, I will stay online and I will answer some questions just by typing. And otherwise, let us take a 13 minute break if you don't mind. So let's come back. Uh, at the quarter to the hour. So in the Eastern time zone, it's 12.45. So wherever you live, it's quarter to the hour for hands-on led by uh, Mina and uh, Devon. Thank you so much. I will read some of the questions and see if I can answer them uh, live or in typing, but please do not go too far. Before you guys have a break, I have a quick announcement. Uh, please download the data set from the Google Drive. There's a link in the, our Google Doc. I will post, a, post on the link mm -hmm. during the break. Thank you so much.
All right, hello, welcome back. Um, I'm Brendan McLean, uh, the lead developer of Skyline. Uh, and I, as maybe you've heard before, last week, um, I did, have been teaching with Olga and Mina for a really long time, uh, almost 10 years now. Um, and yeah, I'm just gonna review quickly uh, the data sets and what we did to them um, last week that Olga has already started talking about um, before handing things over to Mina. And she's then going to show how we would process the outputs. Um, so give a sort of detailed dive into what Olga has been presenting. Um, so anyway, to start. Uh, so last week, we first did this, uh, this Bruder data set where um, what, what we did was we built a library or what the, the experimenters did was they used DDA to, um, in their paper, build what we call a sample specific library. So they just pulled the sample uh, and then collected a bunch of, you know, several DDA runs on just this pooled sample and then, uh, and then built that into a library. And so when you think about statistical priors, the statistical prior that they had was, um, well, I guess I'm gonna cover that. Yeah, so sa sample, sample specific library, the prior that you have is everything in the library is detectable with DDA uh, with the same sample preparation used for DIA. So we took exactly the same sample preparation. We just run DDA on it a bunch and then like, we're going to use everything, and that that's as that's as good as we're ever going to get if we use a tool like MaxQuant or some or some other uh, label-free tool uh, in our DIA data. You know, well, so in our DDA data, we can't possibly detect anything that we don't identify in MSMS. So we take that as a library, all the all the stuff, rather than using the DDA as our quantitative data. We take that and we and we apply that to DIA data, and then what we found is we can get uh, we can get improved uh, we can get more selective data, improve quantitative values to feed into a tool like MSStats, um, and then we also have uh, ideally, and and it was true in this case, we were able to use the same instrument for DDA and DIA, and so you know we have high high confidence that we could detect everything in our library with DDA. We have, you know, it's extremely likely that we'll be able to, to also detect it with DIA. So then uh, the other thing that we did, and this is the data that we're gonna talk about mostly today is, um, is to uh, take a uh, pool data and then fractionate it chemically in some new way so that we get a, a lot of new, new samples, uh, in our case with the Celebsec, 42 different samples, that then we ran DDA on those samples and they're expected not to contain the full set of proteins that were, were that are in the pool. Uh, there's there, some chemical prep, sample preparation has been applied and each one of these samples now contains a subset of proteins. So we think that we ought to be able to get a deeper library, we ought to be able to get more of the proteome. Um, but it may it, it may be that we're now detecting things, or we kind of expect that we're detecting things that we couldn't detect with the sample specific library. We couldn't detect it normally with DVA, but maybe we can detect it with DIA. So uh, deep proteome library prior. So and you can you can do these experiments now. You can get uh, a deep library that somebody else has created. So it's like it was detected on their machine. In this case, we are, everything's done on the same machine, but uh, everything in library is still detectable with DDA. We haven't yet gone to the level of like, we could also just generate a prosit library and then we would have spectra for everything. We'd have predictions for everything, but we'd have no idea whether it was actually even detectable by DDA. So we haven't quite gone that far, which would be expanding our priors to even you know less less certain that we're going to be able to see this stuff. Um, but so everything in the library is at least detectable by DDA, um, 
and usually uh, with many more runs. So there's possi possibility as we increase the number of runs, we we have, uh, and there are plenty of papers about this in the mass in proteomics and mass spectrometry, that as we add a bunch of different runs, we start to potentially inflate false discovery rate. Uh, so we need to be really careful about that with 42 runs. Uh, we might actually get a lot of things that were not detectable. Um, and then obviously it takes a lot more sample preparation uh, if you're gonna do it yourself, free, but you can also then rely on something that somebody else has built. But um, so yeah, usually for broader use and uh, then that which means that if you use something that somebody else has produced, it's unlikely to have the same chromatography as your DIA uh, and maybe not even on the same, same instrument. Um, and, and even in your own lab, it may not have exactly the same chromatography because it took you so many runs to build a library that you know, you're gonna bring it back months, years later and use it. Um, so like the Abersol produced a pan-human library, the Abersol lab produced a pan-human library that they then used for, for many months to years and it's publicly available. So then uh, as Olga described, there's a refinement experiment that was done by the Celebsec team where they didn't necessarily uh, expect it to be a refinement experiment, but we used it as one. Uh, where they did these reproducibility samples, eight of them, and they just used pooled sample and ran DIA on it. And then we can, we can use that to screen from our big library down to, okay, well, let's go back to what we think we have a hope of detecting in this sample. Um, and that's, you know, and, and we can apply certain, certain criteria there. Um, so we could, we could definitely, we could just do like, what was detectable? Did it, what was detectable at all? But we've chosen to do all detection and, and CV. So we do both, is it detectable? And do we think it's got sort of stable quantification? Uh, and that, those are the things. This is, again, this concept of, you know, taking very wide, uh, a very wide starting point with RT prediction could be spectral library prediction or a big spectral library like what we have. Um, unrefined me uh, methods, we might have some previous measurement information, but we put it into this idea of method refinement. And then we feel that if we do that, we can have a better quantitative aspect for fewer things than what we started with. So that this again is that, that loop. And in this case, we're applying refinement of measurability and repeatability. We could do more experiments. And the more prior knowledge you build up of your samples and, and of the things you're trying to measure, like, you know, it, does it experience degradation, digestion? Uh, does, it, does it behave linearly? Uh, we've done all of these at, both on very targeted samples. So then this, again, is just the overview. Uh, the two data sets, CelebSec all, which, uh, and Olga has just been talking about these. This is just like everything, all the noise, everything, we just, we just throw it all into the entire library. We quantify everything and then we give it, we take it out and give it to, uh, to MS Stats and say, okay, what can you find? Uh, and then this is the refinement experiment where we, we take, uh, we had a, a document called CelebSec reps, we imported the replicate data, uh, the repeatability samples, and on the entire library, then we did the refinement of detectability and repeatability. And, um, and then we just used all the things that we felt were detectable and repeatable. And then we were quantif quantifying based on those. So that's the overview of these two data sets that Olga's already been talking about. And then the last thing, I saw what I thought is a great question. Somebody said, oh, what, you know, what's gonna happen to my false negative rate? In other words, am I gonna lose important signal if I, if I do this refinement step? And, and my answer to that is going back to day one uh, at something that, uh, that um, Sue Abitello presented. Uh, and this is a, a figure from like a book written in the 1970s, I think. Uh, so quite a while ago. 
But the concept is it applies to, you know, we're in that case, Sue is applying it to mass spectrometry, but I think it just applies to, to, um, to statistics in general that yes, you may be reducing your signal, but if you're reducing your noise more quickly, uh, then you, your statistics are going to be based on your signal to noise. And so you're, you know, you may feel like, ah, oh, I'm losing all this signal, but you actually may be uh, able to detect more and get better, res better statistical results. So you always have to be thinking about how much am I introducing noise uh, and how much am I introducing new signal or, or removing signal and removing noise. So, you know, I, when we've had these discussions about whether we should use sample specific libraries or big wide libraries and what are the priors, you know, frequently, uh, I think everybody can agree that if all I do is add noise, then, so if all I'm doing is adding peptides that, that are not changing, I'm actually making my life worse. So the more I can, I can know up front and the more I can increase my signal and reduce my noise, the better. Um, and sometimes when I just go with bigger and bigger data sets, all, I'm really just adding a lot of noise. And with that, I will turn things over to, uh, to Mina to, to sort of dive into the details of those data sets we just talked about. Thank you, Brendan. Uh, I hope everyone can see my screen. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Mina Choi. I'm a senior scientist of bioinformatics at NPR department at the Genentech. Uh, as Olga mentioned, I graduate of Purdue uh, Statistics Department and then uh, doing the, my postdoc under the Olga at the Northeastern University. I have worked with the Olga like almost 10 years and then also work with the Brendan almost also maybe more than 10 years, which is really, you know, I was really lucky. Um, and then it is really my pleasure to join the MS and May Institute this year again, and then in introduce the MS that. So my session, the, my goal is to introduce how you can use the MS that. So previously we used the MS that our package and then command line, but this year we want to introduce the MS that shiny, which is the Devon develop. So uh, let's go back to the our our site. So this is the our session site. So I hope to you already go through the this installation part. And then here, if you go here, you can download the data set. So we are gonna start from the data set that what the Brandon provide. You guys already work with this guideline to process the cell of stack data and the broader the data. Today, so we are more focused on the cell of stack data, low CV case versus all. We want to go through one of them and then I already provide all the output and then at the end we want to compare. So you can download all the data set over here. So if you download everything, so you should have the cell of set. Um, the folders. Uh, okay, um, in the folder, we already have uh, this R script to install some dependency. So if you haven't started to install it, you can also use this. So let's go start from the our MS that shiny. There are two ways you can use the MS that shiny application. One is from the GitHub. You can download all the our source code and then run locally. And the second option is you can use the online applications. So today we are gonna work with the GitHub because online application now we have almost 80 people 
I guess uh, we all of us cannot use just one application all simultaneously. So let's go to the, the GitHub first. So this is the GitHub for MS the sh uh, shiny one. So if you click here code, you can download the zip. And then if you unzip it, you can have this folder MS the shiny main. And over here, you can here see the shiny MS that are project files. And then you can double click it. Then the R Studio will be open. And then it should look like this. So I will make this one is a little bit bigger font size. All right. If you have any difficulty, please uh, ask the question in our Q&A. So this is the how it look like. So if you already learned R, and then know about the R. This is the console, which is what we are gonna use. Okay, why background? Yes, I can. So everyone is okay so far, right? So that, yeah, so right panel, this is the console and then here's the, our script and then here's the, the environment, the panel. And then this is show the files and plot and package, etc. So we have to go to the me at the MS that shiny main folder and then just double check. I will type the get working directory. And then here is where I am. If not, you can click more, this more button here, and then set as working directory. Then you're gonna start from this directory. So to run our MS the shiny, uh, I just opened the R script install the dependency.r files. Uh, this part is to install the all the required R, R package. If you already did it, you can just go ahead to the row 10 library shiny. So we are gonna set loading the shiny the package. Then you can type to run app. then the new window will pop up for MS the shiny applications. So this is the shiny application, but still in the background, the still R is running, right? You can see this cursor is here, and then you can see this is stop, stop button means the R is running. So we can see the, all the progress as a background in the R if you use the locally. So let's start from the MS Shiny. This is the open homepage. Uh, they said, okay, what kind of, what, what version of the MS that, what version of the MS that TMT you use. Um, if we go back to the, our folder to download it, uh, the Celeb Sec, the Celeb Sec low CV, we are gonna work with the low CV. Um, and then there are two, there are several files. So something is some R script and et cetera, um, but we are gonna use the, this output from the skyline. So this is the MS that input dash plus CSV. This is originally what the Brandon provide. However, uh, I made a small, the subset of the data to save the, our running time. So when I run 
this uh, data set, it would take the 10 to 20 minutes, uh, but it would, this one is really faster than this one. So just using the four proteins, 400 proteins. So yes, yeah, so this is the how the MS the shiny look like. Okay, so to run the MS the shiny, what you need. So before we move on, let's go over the what exactly MS that workflow doing. So MS that is uh, for protein abundance analysis. Um, and then our original input is some table, which is already identified and then quantified. So we working with the, a, a lot of the data processing tools, the Scala and the Spectronaut, OpenMS, the MaxQuant, PD. And also people ask uh, they is working for the DIA NN or MaxDIA, uh, MaxDIA, et cetera. Uh, the, uh, DIA NN, I think the Matthias is working to make a converters. Uh, Can you make a presentation mode because it's very small? Uh, I I want to keep it because I have to go back and forth, back and forth. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. You you guys already have this presentation, so you can also download this uh, file as well. Yeah. So yes, yeah, so we have a the, we need a data from the data processing tools as MS that you know, input uh, plus, et cetera. Uh, and then most of uh, tools we are working on it, uh, for example, Spectronaut, there are MS that report, report scheme, which generate the MS that require your format automatically. And then um, some other tools, for example, MaxQuant, we use the one of the data out output, the evidence TXT. Etc. So most likely we working with a lot of the data processing tools. Plus we need uh, one more tables we call the metadata. So this processing tools can processing and identify and quantification etc. For all the runs, but we need experiment design information. For example, each MS run from which samples which sample means disease sample one, patient one, or healthy patient two, et cetera. So this one actually we cannot get from the, our processing tool. This is what you know the researchers design. So we need to separate um, the metadata uh, we needed. How it look like is this. So on, we call this is the annotation template. So this is three information, three columns are required. If we are missing one of them, uh, we actually cannot use the MS that um, here, for example, the run or file name for each um, run file ID. And then we have to tell this sample, this run from which condition and then which biological replicate. Uh, the presentation is available in the Google Drive. The Google Drive um, link is available in our Google Sheet here. Data available here. You can you click the here and then you can see the all the data and then presentations. So this is the how it looked like, the three columns. We have a very similar type of the metadata for the TMT. So tomorrow, Ting will talk about the more, the TMT case, we have a more information, MS run and channels, um, but this is the our required. Uh, so we have these files already here, annotation, CSV. And then we have uh, quantification data here, we call the MS that input plus 400. If we had two files available, we are ready to use the MS that shiny applications. So let's go to the first step. So what the first step doing is, 
here. So this is the whole the MS Dev workflow. We, we have a two files and then we input this file into the, our the MS Dev or MS Dev Shiny. Uh, there are multiple steps that happen. The first of all, we read the data and then doing some pre-processing steps. So we filter out some decoy or IRT proteins um, and then share peptide, uh, etc. If we have a multiple peaks, uh, we also aggregate it and then filters some others, uh, etc. This is a kind of the what uh, we are kind of to forget about it, but this is also quite very important step to make a uh, very uniformized uh, um, the data to run the further analysis. And then also we do the transformation first, the log transformation and then normalizations. So we also perform this step. And then from here, we define the missing value and then impute the missing value and then summarize to the protein level. And then we do the testing and also we provide the experiment design. So MS that itself for comment line wise, this is the function name. So first there are one, two, three, four, four big functions um, available and they should run to get the average volcano plot. So first, for, first of all, the first, if you use the, if you use the sky line, uh, you can use the skyline to MS the format function. And then this function perform this, the pre-processing step. If you, you use the max quant, you can use the max quant to MS the format. And then um, they are doing the pre-processing step customized uh, for the MS, uh, max quant, et cetera. And then the next step is the data processing. That, that processing is simple. What they're doing is they do the transformation and then normalization and then up to imputation and then up to protein summarization. So data processing function perform the whole this step. And then the group comparison is a, you know, inference hypothesis testing and then design sample size to provide a power calculation and then sample size calculation. So this is the, how the MS that comment line doing and the, what is the MS the Shiny application also have a same, same workflow. We have a big four step, each big four step also for each function. So data uploading, um, read the data and then doing the pre-processing and then data processing doing the normalization and imputation, the summarizations and the statistical inference is really inference and the future experiment show the number of the sample, uh, number of the biological replicate or the powers. So let's go to the data uploading, the first step. The first step, we have to upload the data. So we have to decide what type of the acquisition we are working on it uh, here, click DIA, and then the DIA, what kind of tool you use, we use a skyline, so click the skyline. And then they just show you what um, the files do you need. So we need the two files. Here we have to upload the MS that report from the skyline. MS that um, skyline, uh, report from skyline, click the browse. So I put, um, I made a, some folder uh, here. So if you download everything, it should be there. And then slip sec. And then there are two folder, slip sec all, and then slip sec low CV. We have to go to the low CV. And then low CV, you have a MS that input plus N plus 400 CSV. This is the file we're gonna working on it. And then click open. Then the next, we have to upload the you know, annotation files. Annotation file, this annotation files. 
So click browse. So same location, I click the annotation CSV and then open. And then here we two, two files are uploaded. And then there are two options. So uh, remove the protein with the one features or the filter with the Q values. So I recommend to use the filter with the Q value. So here, this is the, our default cutoff for Q value and then click upload the data. Then it will take some time to our first step. This uploading data set, they read the data set also goes through the disk processing. So when this is done, they show the summary, so how the MS that recognized this data set. So it is really good, important to review, especially this part, move on before you move on to the next step. So first of all, let's check um, number of the condition six. Yes, six condition we have. And then check number of the biological replicate three. Yes, we have a three. Yes, number of the technical replicate. Yes, we have a one. And then total number of MS run is 18. Yes, correct. Sometimes a very small typo or something like this, you can see the number of the MS run is wrong. Um, maybe 17 or um, so it is really good to check this one first. If you see some numbers is not correct or not is what you expected, you have to go back to the annotations or you have to double check the quantifications. So, and the next they also show the summary of the data set, the brief summaries, the brief statistics. So number of the statistics of proteins, now we have a 400 the proteins are available. And then total number of the peptide, total number of the features here in case of fragment level. And that also tell us the number of the peptide per protein. So one peptide to the 82 and then how many features per peptide we have and the intensity rate. And then this is the how we read this as first the top six rows we, we have. So if you do not see the 400 CSP file, could you double check? I uploaded a few hours ago, maybe just refresh. So here the features means we use the peptide charge or you know the fragment level, we call this is the feature because it will be different by the acquisition type. Um, hey, you know, I, I, is the um, 400 proteins file supposed to be in the low CV subdirectory of the Google Drive? Yes, exactly, yes. Is it titled just MSTAT's input plus or does it have like a specific? MSTAT input plus dash 400. Yeah, I don't actually think it's, I don't think it's, it's not there. there. Yeah. Okay. Sorry about this. Can you see now? Yeah, I see it in there now. Thank you. Sorry for my mistake. Okay, so then, you know, I can wait. I can just talk about a little bit more while you guys just start to uploading. So here, let's talk about the annotation um, template. So uh, the 
kind of the concept for MS that, you know, Olga already talked about, there are some other tools to do the same um, purpose. Um, and then, you know, other hypothesis testing part. Um, and then I also feel uh, from the, our Q&A, people ask the MS that provide the T-test, MS that provide ANOVA, et cetera. So I know the other tools, they provide a several different ways to do it. For example, Pursuits, they provide a T-test, ANOVA, et cetera. So you can customize it. You can de decide what kind of model you want. Um, but in other way around, depending on the, what you choose, the model, the result will be different, conclusion will be different. And then sometimes um, the, some the statistical not, knowledge required to define the right models. So MS that the whole the philosophy I start with is we want to minimize um, the user's decisions especially the modeling, statistical model wise. So our goal is we do not provide the multiple way. We do not provide the ANOVA. We do not provide the t-test, but we the, the, let the MS that recognize the, what is the best model for your data set. And then we are gonna use the best model for your data set. So that is the kind of the, our the main main goal. Which means the user have to tell them what the design we have, how the experiment design look like. So annotation is the place you can tell how your design look like. So we also talk about, uh, we also talk about the linear models or ANOVA, et cetera. And then, yeah, we talk about the factorial design. There are several different types of the design. So we cluster the two different designs. One is the case control design and the other design is the repeated measurement design. So for example, case control design, let's say if you have a two groups, healthy group and then cancer group, and then cancer group, let's say 10 patient and the healthy group, we have a 10 patient. Uh, this 10 patient and 10 patient cannot be overlap each other, right? The cancer patient cannot be the healthy, health, healthy patient. Healthy subject cannot be the you know, cancer subject. So it will be very unique, like the unique 10 subject, unique 10 subject, and then want to compare. We call this is the case control design then we have to tell them they are unique. How we can tell them based on the biological replicate. Biological replicate, this column should be unique. Here we label one to 18. It doesn't matter A, B, C, D, E, F, just matter is how unique or not. Uh, the repeated regimen, sometimes it happened the time course and the pair design. So for example, let's talk about the pair design first. The, we have a healthy and then the cancel, cancer group. However, we actually take the two sample from the one subject, right? So the biological replicate is the same, the A, patient A, but we take the you know, healthy tissue from the healthy tissue, and then we take the cancer tissue. So two different condition, two different sample, but we have a same biological replicate the subject. In that cases, we can label this one is the same. So for example, here, one, one, we have a one subject, but we have a you know, different condition. So if this is the same run and the same design, but depending on how we define this biological replicate column and actually MS that use the different models. For example, here, Everything is the same, just the annotation file is a different, but MS that recognize this one is the time course or pair design. And then the other one is the case control. And then we did uh, um, select the different model. Here we consider subject um, as a random effect and then apply this one and then return to will be will be different. So always, I always want to tell the annotation file is important 
and then the how you define the biological replicator is a key part to um, using the right um, the linear models. This is also same for the TMT uh, case as well. So I think so everyone uh, can load the our the four hundred data set. I guess. So uh, we are gonna do the shiny application using the shiny application. If time allowed, I will show you the R Studio R code um, comment line base. But all the comment line script is already available in the Google Drive. So let's come back. So they wrote, and then we finish the data processing, data uploading part. And then here's the button next step. So click the next step. And then what is the next step part? The next step part is the processing, data processing part, which perform the log transformation. So our log two is our default. And then normalization, we have a several options, known normalization, equalized median and the quantile and then global standard. We have a lot of the question about this normalization method in the Q and A to summarize it. The, all the answers, none, we have a non option, which means we do not perform any extra normalizations. So if you prefer to your manual normalization, definitely yes, you can do it and then select the non and then we do not perform any additional normalizations. Median, uh, equalize the median is our default is our recommendation to make a median value equal. And then quantile normalization is make all the distribution of intensity across a sample are same. Um, this is actually from the genomics data. And then I think this one is the more appropriate for the genomics data um, because the proteomics data, most like, likely what I can see, they have a like, really skewed uh, at the lower abundance one. Um, and then we want to keep this lower abundance as much as possible to decide um, the cutoff, the you know, limit of the quantification level and then imputation. But if we apply the quantile normalization, actually they manipulate and then add much more the bias in the lower abundance one. So I don't prefer to use the quantile uh, case, especially DDA case. And then we have a global standard normalization, which means we can define the, what is the, our standard. So we can define, we can give them specific peptide or protein name, which it should be standard. We know it should be, it should be same across the MS1. So if we use spike some proteins um, to control it, you can use this normalizations. But let's say now we can use this equalized median options. The other option, we have a several options uh, about how, what kind of the feature we use. The first one is used all the features. Uh, DIA cases um, sometimes is really extreme case on thousands of the you know, features per proteins are available, uh, which is kind of, you know, computationally is not that efficient. And then we do not gain much using the older features. In cases that we can click, use the top end features, um, maybe the 100 or 200, which is really a lot. Or you can also use the, you know, 10 or, um, you know, the 30 features you can move around here. Um, but this case, I will use the all features. For the missing value, um, we talk about the imputation. So we are gonna impute uh, not random missing value or the sensor value, but how do we know it? That is the key part. We are lean on the data processing. We are lean on the processing tools and each processing tools um, provide a different identification or protein ident identifications. And also some tools provide some extra information. Uh, and then some tools provide NA as a missing, some tools provide a zero as a 
agenda, uh, for the missing value, etc. So we we'll have to decide which one is um, we have to use it. Skyline is v zero is the missing value. So Skyline uh, provide uh, several more information than others. So for example, truncated peak. So Skyline provide us that peak is a truncated or not. So in case of the truncated peak, that is not the censored and then not the random, more the technical, not the censored uh, missing. This is a more technical or the random missing one. So we can distinguish this truncated peak or really the censored missing one. So the random missing we treat it as an A, but the censored one we treat it as zero or very low value, and then we impute these values. Um, and then this one is the max quantum force and how we define the censored. That is the base on the whole the distribution as to what Olga mentioned. We use the cutoff for 9.999, and then we are gonna sacrifice point, point 0.1 um, quantile um, value as a missing value and then we are gonna impute it. So, and then the imputation option, that is our default. Is the default is we are gonna do the model-based imputation um, that performs in the feature level, not the protein level. But if you don't want, we just want to keep it, you can uncheck it and then the imputation will be not performed. But let's keep our imputation options. At the end of summarization, our default to key medium polish the summarization. Um, and there's another option. So remove the round with over 50% missing value. This is rarely happen, um, but if um, there are more than 50% missing, uh, the two key medium policing, et cetera, uh, is not the idea or the other uh, cases. So in cases, you can click it and then you can remove the runs, which means that specific one, we don't have any the protein um, the quantifications. Then click run protein summarizations. And then it showed the some progress bar here, but in the R as a background, you can also see the whole the progress. This is the how uh, you can also get this one from the log file to track the what kind of, you know, steps go through it. For example, here, um, yes, the feature one or two are across the remove, the fraction is already handles, missing value mark and as an NA. Um, here, like this much intensity are zero or less than one, which will be imputed. Uh, low, this is low under cutoff 8.29. The log to intensity level less than this value, we assume this is the sensor and there will be imputed, um, et cetera. Yes, so normalization is done in the feature levels. Yes, normalization. Here we go. So normalization. Um, based on the whole the distribution of the intensity before in the hour the protein uh, levels. What is the cutoff for sensor? Um, we decide what missing value will be imputed. The two step first step is based on the spectra uh, spectra data processing tools. They provide NA or zero. We think this is also a uh, missing value, and then we are going to impute it. However, uh, I guess the Olga already showed you um, some slide here. For example, this case, we checked all in the distribution of the old intensity. 
sometimes they have a really skewed, there are really lower bandhans one. So it could be noise, it could be, or really, you know, small value. And then we defined under there's some, this lower long tail, we defined this one is really low, it's not accurate um, because it's a lower than limit of the quantification. So we define this cutoff based on this distribution. This is the kind of the cutoff of what we talk about it. Yes. So when this is done, our all the progress bar is, is gone and then it shows some result. So summarize the result is so update the summarized result and then show us the protein quantum. What is the second step? Here, the, our second step is the data processing. At the end, what we can get, this is the, our output. We can get the protein quantification after imputation, um, normalization and the imputation, we can get the, the protein quantifications. Uh, this, uh, so we have a quantification, a protein level summarization, and then this is the how it shows. So for example, here, the protein R0046, um, this is the condition one, and then biological replicate one, this is the our protein quant, and then this is a for the other sample, and this one is a for the other sample, etc. So this one, you can download it. If you download it, you can just define, uh, define the file name. You can change the file name and then save. You can save, save this one. But I like to show this a summarization plot. So before we move on to the inference stage, we can actually see how the data look like. This one is to show the uh, provide the visualization. So first of all, quality control plot, what kind of all the proteins. This is the how it look like. So this is the after normalization. Now this median value. So each box is whole intensity across the whole the protein for one each each runs. And then now this median value is equal. That's because we use the equalize the median, the method, right? And the next step, so we can also double check that our normalization is work or not. And then here you can see here, there are some, some the zero values, which is the missing value. And then you can see this, we have uh, some long tail at the lower abundance cases, right? And the next one is the profile, the proteins show us each protein level, how the data look like. So there are several options. So let's say transition level and then show the plot. You can select the what protein you want to see. So let's click the first one. Then, okay, there are so many features. There are 34 features and there's so many um, the features there. So, so they actually cut off the real one. So then this is to show the whole the transition legend. The legend is so big. So let's remove the legend smaller. So peptide level legend. So now we can show the all the, you know, feature level legend is gone and then show the peptide level. So now you can see which color for which peptide, but still also big. And then click here, so no feature legend. So I want to remove this one want to focus on more the visualization here. Then now all the legend is gone, but actually show us the how original the data look like for this protein. And then this is the feature level. And then we already summarized by protein level, then click show protein summary. Then it showed, okay, based on the whole the feature, this red dot is our protein quantification. And then we are gonna use this, not the gray line, we are gonna use this red dot for the next step. And you can also play around the other. 
You can also play around the others. You can see other proteins. For example, here, this specific protein, some specific feature is completely missing for this one. You can, you can go over other proteins as well. And then click saved um, this plot, and then you are gonna save as a PDF. So you can keep uh, which any of the proteins you are interested in. So here, the, you know, download the data sets. So here, uh, after this, we can download the feature level data. Let's download the feature level data and then look. So feature level data, I just download, or I can download in the our folders. I can go to the our folder, no CV, okay, save. And then you can also download the protein level data as well. So go to the, our same locations. So here, so we have a feature level data and then we have a protein level data. So let's open it. So this is the how feature the protein level data look like. It show uh, some information. So for example, here protein one. Okay, I can make this one is big. Yes, so for example here, protein R00406 uh, for this original one, group uh, type point zero and subject one, their protein quant is a 15.218, something like this. And then to get these numbers, uh, total group measurement, there are uh, 54. And then what is the number of the features they have is 18 features. And then there are no missing value. And then this is the how we get it. And let's say here some, this proteins. So this protein for the first subject, and then this group, this is the protein quant we have. Um, originally total to 270, but this uh, sample, there are 84 features and then the, like this much, you know, percentage of missing value. So you, you can see um, this information from the protein level data. Okay, so now we are done for these steps. So let's move on to the next step. Next step is the inference stage, the really testing stage. So click the next step. That is the statistical, the inference step. So here, uh, this part is the important part. We have to say, what kind of the comparison do you want? And already this shiny has all the condition information. They know there are six condition, but how you want to define it. So there are several options. The first one, all possible pairwise comparison. Let's click it and then submit it. And then it showed all the possible pairwise comparison. So for example, here, time point zero versus time point of 15 and then time point zero versus the 13, et cetera. And then 15 versus the 30, 15 versus the 60, et cetera. And they show the, how the contrast metrics look like. What is that this means is, this is the, how the contrast metrics means. Let's say we want to compare time point zero versus the 120 minutes. Uh, we defined like here, the one, 
and then minus one, and then other thing is zero. How? This is the num is a constant for each condition. So for example, here constant minus one times so time point zero, and then zero times time point fifteen, etc. And then the time point one twenty minutes, the constant is the one. And then the we times the zero, so we can remove the, all the middle terms. And then what the left is t120 minus t0, um, the controls. So if we define the same one, but if we just so flip it, if you change our constant, here's the one in the minus one. In the cases, the middle one is also, you know, the we completely remove it. And then what happened is, okay, this is the, I uh, made a mistake here. This is the time point zero minus time point 120 minutes. This is the how we defined. So let's come back to the our contrast the metric. So this is a kind of the what would automatically define it. But uh, for most likely the zero point is our control. And then we want to put this control to the second part, the later, right? We want to compare, compare to compare how much increasing, how much decreasing for them, the zero should be the later. So I don't like it. I just don't like this one. So I just clear the metrics. And then what is the second options? Click the compare all against one. So we can tell against one. So we can tell which one is our control. So here, time point zero is our control and then submit it. They calculate, um, the, they def define the comparison um, against uh, our control. So for, for, for example, here, 15 minus our time point zero and then 13 um, versus the time point zero, et cetera. So this is a kind of the more the reasonable and the easy to interpret it. So I'm gonna go this one, but I will talk to you or something else. So let's practice other options. Create the customized pairwise compare. So we can actually create it. Um, so for example here, um, this is the versus the two. So two will be denominator part. So I said zero, and then I want to compare just 15 and then add, and then they're gonna add the 15 time versus so zero um, minute. And then we can also add here 120 minutes versus a zero time, and then click add, and then here, et cetera. So you can add or you can just customize your um, comparison metrics. But there's another way we can create it. We can actually give them the constant. So previously this three one is always we can compare the two pairs, one versus the others, one versus others. But sometimes if we have a more complex design, for example, I want to compare mean of the two condition versus others, the our constant should be the different. So for example, here's our control, it should be minus one, but I want to compare mean of the disk two comp uh, condition versus others. And then you can point five and then point five, but we have to define it. So for example, mean um, of the 15 and 13 versus T0 and then click add. They can add more to customize the comparisons. So this is the how you can play around for, for your, um, your experiment. But I like this one. I just don't want to compare uh, all, all the other time point against time point zero. So then after we define the our contrast matrix, click start, and then they're gonna start to compare. What they are doing based on the our the annotation, based on how they recognize 
um, the design. They find the best model for your design and then apply and then all the calculate the, all the values here. So when it's done, okay, here they show the result. So this result panel only show the significant one based on this cutoff. So now we want to significant level less than 0 0.05. So based on this adjusted p-values, you can also play around you can order it. Like here, so zero, so zero is not really zero, it's a really small value, but this is the how you can sort it at you. Maybe you can check this one. This point zero four nine two is really close to point zero five. Um, this is the how they show it. Um, but you can also download everything. See here, click download, down, download all the model widget, and then here. So let's say I just want to save this one to our folders. Okay, so not the download here. Slapsack, oh yes, Slapsack, low CV and save. Yes, here, test Richard we have. So this is the, our, the Richard. So let's look at this. So for example, here, protein one, protein R0406 for this comparison, zero time versus the 15 minutes. This is the hour log to four change and then standard error, p-value, degree of freedom, and adjust p-value, and then NA is so no, no issues. And then the missing percentage is a zero. There's no missing values. But here, this proteins uh, for 16 minutes versus zero minute. Um, here's the hour adjusted p value, but there are one percent is missing value. So this missing value means the feature level the missing value. Um, now here issue is everything is NA. But if one specific condition is completely missing, so for example, here, uh, 15 minutes versus the zero minute, if the 15 minutes is completely missing, um, they cannot calculate uh, log for change or standard error, et cetera. So only the measurement available in the zero minutes, we cannot calculate anything. So here all should be NA, but if you say the one condition is missing, or sometimes it's a rare case, but if two conditions both are missing, they say completely missing. So this is the how you can see uh, the your the result. Um, this is the how we result, um, but we also provide some visualization tools. So there are several visualization tools the volcano plot and heat map and comparison plot. The volcano plot, let's say uh, if you click all, you can save as a PDF, but it was not showing in, um, in the Shiny application, but you can select the one condition, let's say the 120 minute versus a zero, uh, and then click the view plot in browsers. Now you can see the volcano plot here. You can also click apply the specific four chain cutoff here. Four change cutoff one is the so log to level. This is a zero. So I said the two four changes. Now they are only mark uh, higher or lower than uh, two four changes. This one is interactive. 
So now here, bottom there, click the plot for details. If you click this dot, they show that this dot is for which proteins, this proteins, and then show the log for changes for which comparison and I'll just p value. I click one and then you can see this one is for which proteins. And let's say we can click this one too, you can see here. Or you can also click the display the protein name and then they just show the, the whatever the labeled up or down regulated one, they labeled um, that is for rich proteins. And then the other one is the comparison plot also quite interested in. So comparison plot is for each proteins. So each protein, they just want to see across the whole the comparison, how, how it look like. So here we have a one to say for five comparison and then compare to the, our control. So here you can see the hour trend. Here's a you know 15 minutes after, and then this is the 30 minutes after, and then this is the 16 minute after, and then nine minute after, and then 120 minute after. You can see the whole trend, and then the dot is the log four changes, and then bar is the error bars. And then you can also change the which protein you want to draw it. And then, for example, this case is actually they are decreasing, et cetera. So, and you can also save as a PDF. That is the, uh, the testing part. And then after testing part is done, uh, we already calculate the, all the variance component from the models. And then based on this variation, we can actually can calculate the powers and then um, sample size calculation. This is the, our last step, the future experiment. So click next step. So there are two options. Which one do you want to estimate? Sample size or power? Click the sample size. Uh, and then you can see, share. So because the sample size we want to uh, sample size, this one is inactive. Um, you can say, I want to increase the power to 90%. And then this is the our force discovery rate, what I want. And then this is the desire for changes. So for example here, if your desire for change 1.5 with the 90% power going up and then see, you need the two replicate per conditions. If your desire for change is 1.3, with the 90% of the power, let's check going up, you need a five uh, biological replicate per conditions. And definitely, and here you can see, you can see this number as well. So Y, Y4, Y, etc. And then you can download the, um, this plot as well. Also, you can calculate the powers. So now how many samples we have? So now we have a three samples, right? The three per condition. And then this is our um, discovery rate and then DJI four changes. So this is the power for 1.4 DJI four changes. Here, now we have a 90% the power we have. And then you can also download it um, this plot. So this is the whole of uh, the workflow when you use the uh, MS that uh, the shiny applications. Okay, so then um, now we have uh, some minutes. So after we close it, Let's see, let's go over how we can run in the comment line. So go to the our photos, left sec, and then low CV one, low CV folder. You have a here R script, the low CV R script. Okay. 
it also performed the same things as what we talk about it. Um, advantage is you can see the more option on it and then you can see the more intermediate uh, result. So for example, uh, you can also, you know, have a lot of the customization one, but this is the main thing the same. Skyline to MS that format, this is what we are doing, the pre-processing step. Next step, data process, uh, doing the normalization and then imputation and then summarization. Then all the visualization with what we show, the QC and then profile plot. Uh, and then we can also use uh, the contrast matrix and then the group comparison part here and also visualization for volcano plot and here the design sample size part. Uh, you can also go through, uh, you can use this, the, the common line um, based the MS that as well. Okay, so for example, we use the 400 one, which include the 400 protein, but I remove it. We already have um, this MS that input plus a CSV file, including the whole the data set. So let me just try to show you how it looked like. So first of all, we have to call the MS that here. And then we have to read this file, which is original file, original, the low CV file. Okay, so I have to define my working directory here. So under the slab set low CV. So previously we worked with the data set with only 400, um, but original this low CV data is has so more than 2000 proteins here. So I just double checked how many unique protein name um, in this file. So low CB is a 2,078 proteins are there. Uh, and then if you see the all, Celebsic all also have a same thing. So you have a R script and then you already have a, a output and everything. And then this one is from the all case. It has more than 3,000, almost 4,000 proteins are there and then it took longer, much longer than the low CV case. Uh, but the, all the output is R there. You can also see and then play around. The for example, visualization for protein um, plot. Um, if you use the common line, you can save the, all the protein, the profile plot. So now you can see here, there are more than 2000 pages there. Each pages have all the protein information. So you can scroll and then see how it looks like, or you can searching it if you have a very specific proteins you are interested in. So you can uh, play around here. Um, at the end, I want to show you how much is a different, the low CV cases in all um, cases. But before I move on, do you have any questions? I think the so Devon already answered all of the questions. Sometimes after summarization, the protein level distribution of the each sample is not even. Yes. Do you think that we should do another normalization at the protein level? Um, I prefer not. 
So for me, the normalization, the what is the goal for normalization for this step is just want to remove uh, the systematic errors, right? Um, uh, when we normalize and the multiple step of the processing is important, but it will be very, uh, we have to aware of too many processing step actually can ruin the data. Uh, so that's why the normalization is a really key part. And that sometimes if our assumption for each normalization is not suitable for your case, actually you can completely ruin the data. One of the example is, you know, IP experiment. You know, IP experiment is, you know, we talk about the whole the protein uh, global global protein profiling. So we just quantify the, all the protein in the samples. But IP case is quite different, right? So we have a bead and then we actually grab the whatever interact. And then there, first of all, the total quant of the protein is are different. And then their level also really different. Um, but uh, what we are proposing, the normalization, especially the equalized media and then quantile um, uh, normalization, we have assumption, we have a larger number of the sample, uh, the intensity, and then there are the majority should be equal. Majority should be not changed across the sample. So based on this assumption, we can do it. Um, however, um, for example, IP case, you know, this assumption is not suitable anymore. So we should not use this normalizations. So so multiple step normalization also very good. So we can do the many processing step, but so many processing step also can ruin the data set. So we have to be careful. And then for me, the normalization step, this normalization um, just to remove the systematic error. And then we want to keep the other variants as much as possible. So protein level, uh, my question is the protein level distribution should be equal. Um, more the feature level is original our data set and the much more variant of uh, the much more the intensities are there. I think that one is more suitable, but the protein level still I have a question mark and then prefer to minimize the, our, um, it's hard to make uh, some balance, but I try to keep the you know, feature level and then do not perform the protein level, the normalizations. So compare the MS that and the pursuits. So that is really the good question and the most common. So as I mentioned, the pursuits and the MS that have a different philosophy. The pursuits uh, is really GUI software, right? The pursuits, you can do many things. You can customize it. You can do T-tests, ANOVA, and many things you can select it. Um, and then they also provide some linear model, but you have to define the, what is the best for, for yours, which means they have a lot of the flexibility, but still need the statistical knowledge to make a right decision. And then sometimes we have to diagnose this too. So MS that do not provide a multiple way, but we want to provide the best without your decisions. So it is really hard because the MS that have only one best model, but per pursuits, they have a multiple output can be um, conclusion we can have it. So I think this is not um, the fair enough. Uh, definitely they have a pros and cons, but it's really hard to compare the performance itself. So, and then IP experiment, you need to first remove the background. So IP1, so right, so IP1 is that there are several ways. So this one is we have a think about the different ways. So as I mentioned, all the MS that background, you know, our baseline is based on the global protein profiling, right? Not based on for IP case, right? So we can think about some different way because this one is actually there. Yes, there are some some proteins are there or not, right? The more MS that on the relative scale, we can compare to how much their difference, um, but this is not the suitable for, yes, they have it, yes or yes, 
they have a proteins are there or not, right? So there are some other, um, the tools are there. The Saint is also quite popular for these cases, even though they used some different one, they used a spectral count, not the intensity, right? So, so that's why you have to know like the, what kind of tools doing something and so on. So IP cases is a little bit tricky and then it's hard to follow the general workflow the MSTEP in terms of the normalization, how to remove, etc. cetera. Uh, in that case, I also recommend to you can also double check the other two tools, for example, the Saint as well. Okay, so we have a five minutes. Uh, I can show you, uh, this is not the MS at all. This is more R. And then this is how this, you know, their data is different. I try to make a simple code as much as possible. So let's go to the Celebsec folder first, click and then set the working directory. Um, so we have to install this to prior one. So first the two line, we call the two data. So one is from the all CELEPSEC, and then the other one we from the low CV case. And then let's grab and then just run it. So now this the test, test have a both data set, and then want to compare, want to compare the first one. I want to compare how many the significant proteins are available for both case and then how much different number of the significant proteins are there. So from test based on this cutoff, I just run here. This is the how it look like. So for first comparison, 15 minute versus a zero minute, all have a three, 33 proteins are significant, but low CV have a 47. And then here you can see the numbers are the different, right? The all cases have always more, oh, except the first case, right? Okay, this is the number, but this is really 33, all are significant in the low CV or how much they are overlapping, how much they have a same conclusion. So we can check this one from the Venn diagram. So here, uh, for example, I grabbed uh, the, this third comparison, the T3 versus the T, um, the time point zero, which it should be the all have a 454 and then low have a 399. And then I want to check how much are their overlap? So there are three different way, you know, just how we make a visualization. The first one from the G plot function call, and then the function called van. Here it is. Number wise, look like around the fifty proteins are different. However, however, when we actually check this Venn diagram, Venn diagram. Here, there are only 215 proteins are same conclusion, but the other one is unique. So they have a pretty much like 30, 40% are different conclusions. And okay, here, this is the very simple one, but the other tools, GGV and N something, some other package, make some colors and then can show some different visualization and, and they shall show the percentage. They said only 42% is overlap and then 30% and 25% is they are unique. So this is a kind of the, what I can see is, and then, you know, I was interested in, okay, then what is the, this unique case? What is the, this unique case, right? So this is the, how I just check it. I just grabbed um, the T3 versus T0 uh, comparison. Um, and then show it. For example, 
this protein is not significant in all, but this one is significant in the low CV, et cetera. So I just grabbed some cases here, YAL061W, this one. Uh, definitely they have a different conclusion. The first one is really not significant. The second one is kind of the borderline, um, but the second one, the low CV, the first one from the all, and then the low CV, no missing, all, they have almost a 70% missing. And then even the low for changes, the direction is different. This is the minus directions, up down regulation, but this one is up regulations. So this is the kind of the what um, we can double check. So when you find these cases, so what you can do it, you can double check the profile plot, and then actually you can go back to the, um, the skyline file, and then you can just digging into how it look like, the, how the chromatography look like, or is there something um, you can see, etc. So this is the last item. So you can, I want to share how to compare, and then this the script is also available in the the drive, Google Drive. Okay, so this is the all the items uh, I cover. Um, I will stay here five or 10 minutes uh, more. So please ask a question if you have. Um, if not, um, thank you for attending today's session. So tomorrow the team and then Devon will be coming back for the TMT. And then the Thursday I will come back to talk about the, how we can uh, submit our data set in the public repository. Thank you, everyone. So uh, I have a question about the, you know, the technical replicates, right? So technical replicate, we are not merging technical replicate to the subject. We keep the technical replicate uh, sample and they use the model. This is the best case. So we are not summarize the technical replicate to the, the sample case. So let's go back to the, our annotation. We recognize the technical replicate in the, our annotations. So here we go. So now that's a one condition and then replicate and then run. So we should have always one should be unique, but let's say we have a technical replicate for this one, how we define it. The technical replicate means we have a same condition, the same biological replicate, but one ID should be different, right? So it should be something too, right? So which means if we have a um, one condition for one biological replicate, for example, here, if you have a two uh, run, we recognize this is the technical replicate and then keep it as much as possible. And then we just keep it as a protein uh, quantification and then consider this in the inference step, the hypothesis testing step. Oh, yeah, I'm not sharing, okay. Sorry about this. Yeah, here we go. Okay, I will repeat this one again. The last part, let's say this uh, condition and then this biological replicate, we assume that we have a technical replicate, which means this is the same, but the one is the different. So same biological replicate, same condition. If we have a multiple uh, run, we assume this is a technical replicate. Another story we have, if we have a fractions, 
fractions, we can have it. If you have a fraction, fraction column is required. We need to define the fractions, fraction one and two. Then they said, this is not a technical replicate, this is a fraction, but without the fractions, if you have a multiple one, this is the, uh, the technical replicate. Do you have any other questions? Yeah, and um if you have an error or any suggestion about the master shiny, um, something not working and then something is not what we expected, please uh, report to MS Tech Google group and then Devin and the Matthias can help. And then it will be also help to uh, fix the hour debug. Devin, do you have any kind of the most common question we can mention? Um, not really. I think a lot of people have been having some trouble installing um, the package. Installing. Yeah, so just what I would say, if you're on Windows, because the new version of MS Stats requires you to compile some C++ code, if you're on Windows, make sure you install our tools as well, um, along with R4.2 and MS stats and like once once you install our tools everything should be able to install correctly um but that's yeah i think that that would clear up a lot of problems thank you yes so comment line scripts there shiny works um yeah, if you have a big data set, if you have your own DIA data set, I recommend to use the locally, not use the, our online applications. All right, the MS the Chinese can do the step for the peptide level. Need us some data manipulations. So we have a two input. We need a annotation input and the quantification input. The quantification input, there are protein name column. If you replace this protein name column for the peptide, and they're actually running with the, the peptide levels. Okay, some new questions. Batch effect. Uh, simple answer, no. <laughs> so you have to do the, your manual work to fix the batch effect. Right, so MS that we try to find the best model based on our frame, but another the cons is it's not the multi flexible. So if you have a, like some, for example, date effect, you know, some other the batch effect, you know, cohort effect, it is not that flexible. You can apply the the 
apply this variable in the linear model. In the cases, I recommend to use the lemma. Lemma from the protein quant. So up to here, data processing, you can use them as that. Um, then later, uh, you can use the, some other the method. Yeah, we have a 24 people. I hope they're running. <laughs> they're running the hour shiny. Um. Uh, we, I, I have a one question. Uh, I think I don't understand the question. Could you rephrase again? Philosopher, um, Deva, do you have any idea about the philosopher? Yeah, it was, I think it was actually just added um, just in added. the new version of MSS TMT. I'm not sure if there's, a, actually, I think there's, I think it's available now for base MSS and MSS TMT. Okay. Um, just mm -hmm. recently. Mm -hmm. Diane and then it's a coming, right? Devon. Diane. Uh, Diane. I'm not sure. sure. Yeah, I'm not positive about that. Mm -hmm. So most of current MS that is a four four, right? Not for two. Yeah, it's four point four point two, I think. Exactly. So let me check MS that. I think philosopher unless that base not yet. Oh, okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. I just found it in um, TMT. TMT. So it's definitely in TMT. I thought that the, it used uh, base MSTATS functions, but maybe it doesn't. Yeah, it's definitely in TNT, uh, TMT though. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so TMT. Open them as, yeah, maybe the T will give it the right answer tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah, spectral mind. Yeah, philosopher, yes. Yes, philosopher, yes. Yes.
if we don't have any questions, then I will let you go. Thank you again, everyone. And then see you soon, tomorrow or the Thursday. Bye.